other parts of the UK and even from outside the UK. So it's it's a really exciting um, a meeting for us. Um, also, um, this meeting is being broadcast live through a lot of social media platforms, which is an initiative by Dr. Sadiq Bayani, who's our first speaker, uh, who's well known uh, for these initiatives in the pain uh, community circle. So he probably would talk a bit more about that. And uh, for those of you who have not um, are not familiar with the Welsh Pain Society, we are um, a small but quite a vibrant and active pain society with a truly multidisciplinary membership and participation, as you may have guessed from the ASM program. Um, like most societies and groups, we would have preferred to meet, um, to, to have a regular conference, meet people in person, socialize, network, uh, catch up with friends. But Unfortunately, due to COVID, I think we're all getting used to virtual meetings. So the obvious advantage of the virtual meetings is that we can get some excellent speakers from all, all around the world without um, them having to bother with the travel and everything. Regular conference meets people will be able to attend these meetings, global meetings from the comfort of our own homes without having to um, go through boarding um, security check-ins. Um, so I'm sure you'll... Uh, enjoy today's program and consider supporting the Welsh Pain Society for future events as well. So thank you all for joining us and especially the speakers for giving up their time for our benefit. So I'll pass over to Dr. Kafaf and Dr. Dasari to start the first session. Thank you, Neeraj. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Sunil Dasari. I work as a consultant in anesthesia pain medicine at the University Hospital of Wales, Cardiff. I'll be co-hosting this meeting with Dr. Ranj Kafaf. He's a consultant anesthesia and pain medicine at Prince Charles Hospital. Uh, today's meeting is actually a, we have a global audience. It's going live on uh, anesthesia and pain TV. And then everyone attending today, welcome Croiso. So if you have any questions, please put the questions on the chat box. There is a coffee break at 10.30 and 11.50. Yeah, so we've got a very good topics today. We've got excellent speakers. So without wasting any time, let's start the meeting. Yeah, the first speaker today is uh, Dr. Sadiq Bayani. He is uh, well known internationally. He's a consultant in anesthesia and pain medicine at uh, uh, University Hospital Lister. He's also a consultant, consultant in neuromodulation at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital in London. He is an excellent teacher. He is now a clinical lead uh, for e-pain learning platform of Faculty of Pain Medicine. He, is, he has won a lot of uh, uh, awards for his clinical work as well as for his teaching. He is a keen advocate of the benefits of regional anesthesia. So please welcome Sadiq Bayani. He is going to talk on an update on ultrasound-guided interventions Talk to talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sunil, Neeraj, and Ranj. Thank you guys for giving me an opportunity to share my kind of work and knowledge about ultrasound in pain medicine. So can you guys see my screen? Uh, Neeraj? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, we can see your screen. Fantastic. Right. Great. Thank you. Right, so guys, uh, as uh, Sunil already mentioned, I, I actually work at Leicester and uh, Guys and St. Thomas Hospital in London. So in terms of the conflict of interest, there's nothing to disclose. I, I do work as a certified interventional pain sonologist uh, and I've done the CIPS exam and FIPP exam conducted by World Institute of Pain. And I work as a faculty on uh, various courses, including NISORA, uh, World Academy of Pain Medicine United, World Institute of Pain and ASRA courses. Uh, you know, my interest in the field of um, pain medicine education uh, led me to find Leicester Pain Education, uh, Gulf Pain School and Mumbai Pain School. So I actually run these platforms to spread the knowledge uh, in various parts of the world. And I'm co-founder of Pain TV. Today's, as uh, Sunil mentioned, today's uh, sort of meeting is being lively broadcasted on anesthesia and pain TV. So people in different parts of the world can actually get, get the knowledge. Right, so let's start. Uh, why to use ultrasounds? I think, you know, uh, 
it's a point of care diagnostic tool. Like, you know, in, uh, in ICU, people are now using echo to find out the, car, you know, uh, cardiac status, uh, the, the, the volume status, and during COVID, I think they're using kind of, you know, ultrasound to, to find out about the condition of the lungs. So I think for us as a pain physicians, uh, ultrasound is an excellent diagnostic and the therapeutic tool. And uh, it's like a stethoscope for pain physicians. And I think we all should actually invest more time learning ultrasound because, you know, we can diagnose the conditions there and then. Uh, you know, by using dynamic ultrasound scanning. It's an out, outpatient based use. So basically you don't need a radiographer. You don't need uh, to sort of, you know, uh, have a lead lined room. So the resources basically need are less. Uh, you, uh, you have quite a lot of clinical effectiveness. So if you use ultrasound, the way I explain it to the patient is, uh, you know, it is clinically effective. Why? Because you're putting the uh, right medication in the right area. And, you know, the, the rule is if you put the right medication, the right area and the right amount, it should work right. So, you know, it, gives, it, it improves your clinical efficacy. Uh, you can technically be very much uh, accurate uh, and uh, it makes you safe. You can avoid uh, structures like blood vessels, lungs, you know, so it, it, it actually is a great tool. It is cost effective. As I said, uh, you don't need to, you know, have a lead line room. You, you, you don't need to have kind of, you know, uh, a radiographer. And there's a quick, quick turnover of cases. So we do, I do have uh, one ultrasound list, a dedicated ultrasound list every week. And we do about sort of, you know, eight to nine cases. Uh, so it allows you to have a quick turnover. And, you, you know, you can actually perform this procedure on an outpatient basis. You don't need to admit them in a day case. So benefits, you can visible, you know, you can actually uh, uh, visualize muscles, ligaments, nerves, tendons, bone services, it gives you live dynamic images. So it's not like static image like x-ray, uh, unless you do live screening on fluoro, but live dynamic images with the ultrasound, uh, relatively less expensive than fluoroscopy and real time needling. So you exactly know which structure you're targeting and where your needle is heading. Now, there are challenges. It is operator dependent, especially with the diagnostic part of the ultrasound. Uh, you do need to actually invest a lot of time in, in, in sort of training yourself. So it is patient dependent. So if patient's body habit is, is on a higher side, sometimes it becomes difficult to actually see these structures uh, under ultrasound. Uh, Anisotropy is another phenomenon which majority of you know uh, who practice regional anesthesia. You have to have ultrasound probe targeting the right structure perpendicularly. Otherwise, you will get an anisotropy. There's a lot of training that you do need to do. Uh, and it's all about pattern recognition and hand-eye coordination. More and more you do, more you more get, you're better at it. So... Okay, so what we're going to do today is basically take a journey uh, of the ultrasound guided interventions from top to toe. So we start with the cervical spine, then move on to shoulder, hip, knee, lumbar spine, and abdominal and pelvic interventions. So basic ultrasounds, I think, uh, you know, I thought I'll just put this slide because, you know, uh, it is very important to have your fundamentals right. You know, if you have a good building blocks, you know, the building becomes strong. So I think know your equipment, uh, know the basics, you know, right kind of probe, right depth, right gain, right focal zones. You do need to know the anatomy because the issue with ultrasound is, you know, a lot of times people are using ultrasound, but they need to know the anatomy uh, in detail uh, because you need to know when, you put, when you're trying to scan a structure, what should you expect? What muscles, what nerves, uh, what vessels, so, you know, what, blood, um, what, what bone is there in that particular area? Uh, so, you know, and start with easy cases when you actually practice using ultrasound. So with trigger point injections, you know, you can actually pick up triggers very accurately with the ultrasound. And uh, I don't do any blind injections in my practice. And I can tell you, I think there is a reason for it. Uh, and patients also, you know, uh, appreciate you using an image guidance because, you know, it gives them a confidence that you are doing a technically right injection. So start with easy and then you can move on to the complex stuff. So uh, when you're actually trying to hit the target, a bullseye, you know, you need to know your equipment. You need to know uh, how to use the ultrasound. So a few things for the success, you know, it's all about ergonomics. So you would say the image on right, you know, you're trying to turn your neck. It's not the right ergonomics. You need to have hand, head and the ultrasound all in the same line. So don't do this, okay? Second bit is needle must be in the exact center of the probe. And that's the only time you will be able to see the needle throughout its shaft. Uh, so it's very important 
to actually have the needle exactly in the middle of the probe. If you can't see the needle, then you know you do the part maneuver, so pressure, axial rotation, and tilt. Uh, you try to move the needle in the plane of the beam. So cervical spine, let's start with cervical spine. So the interventions I'll talk to you is steelhead ganglion, uh, cervical sympathetic trunk. The reason I've used the word cervical sympathetic trunk is because when you use ultrasound, you do not perform steelhead ganglion block. You perform the block at the level of C6 and you basically allow the gravity to spread the local anesthetic onto the cervical sympathetic chain. Uh, then we'll talk about cervical nerve roots, medial branches, third occipital nerve and greater occipital nerve. So steelhead ganglion block, as I said, uh, you know, it's at the uh, sort of, you know, C71 junction. And basically, if you can see my pointer, it's located in this area. And you have got quite a lot of vascular structures in this area. And I think, you know, gone those days when we were actually doing the, uh, the procedure with fluoroscope, because fluoroscopy will not tell you, uh, have you already hit the vessel? You know, fluoroscopy will tell you the spread of the, spread of the dye, but it will not prevent the damage uh, that will take place. So this is what the pictures you will get. So when you actually put the ultrasound probe at the level sort of C6, you can see all the soft tissue structures quite nicely. Uh, this longus coli muscle, you've got a sternocleidomastoid muscle, uh, basically, and you've got longus, col long longus capitis. And this is the fascial plane that, where you have a, a medial uh, sim cervical sympathetic chain, middle cervical sympathetic chain. You've got a uh, carotid artery, and you can see the local anesthetic being deposited, uh, sort of, you know, and you can do this real time. So, and this was a time when we used uh, sort of x-rays to do this block where, you know, we targeted uh, the, the, the C7, then you injected the dye and you looked at the spread. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it's if, if you can do the cervical sympathetic chain block with the ultrasound, uh, then that is basically a good way to perform the procedure. And why I tell you, because, you know, they have validated this with cadaveric studies, you know, where they've injected the methylene blue dye and they've dissected the cadavers. And, you know, there's a very, very accurate spread of the uh, methylene blue along the sympathetic chain using uh, the ultrasound guidance. So it's a well-validated cadaveric kind of, you know, uh, sort of a procedure uh, that is now being very commonly performed. Uh, and if you know how to use ultrasound, it's, it's, it's actually a, a, a very good procedure to perform. Now, why to perform the ultrasound guided cervical sympathetic chain? You know, there are so many vascular structures. And as I say to you, a lot of people ask me, like, well, you know, you can perform cervical nerve root block using x-ray. Why do you need ultrasound? Ultrasound tells you about the blood vessels. So this is a picture that's showing you inferior thyroid artery or serpentine artery. And you know, would you see this artery when you use X-rays uh, uh, to perform the cervical sympathetic chain block or steely ganglion block? You know, X-rays don't show the soft tissues. X-rays will show only bones, and you're just only using bony landmarks. So using the ultrasound will prevent the damage to this artery and prevent the spread of the local anesthetic and prevent the complication like patient getting a local anesthetic toxicity. So it's very important to actually, you know, uh, keep this in mind that the ultrasound prevents the complication of this procedure. Okay, so from my side of thing, you know, if you ask me if cervical sympathetic chain, steelhead ganglion block, ultrasound, you know, do it. It's, it's a good way to actually do the cervical sympathetic chain block. Okay, now let's talk about the cervical uh, spine anatomy. Uh, you know, I'm going to tell you some basics and how to know the levels so, you know, when you scan the cervical spine, you have uh, C6 level, you have anterior and posterior tubercle. Uh, at C7 level, there is no anterior tubercle. Then you only have posterior tubercle. And I've actually given these names. So C6 looks like a ghost and C7 looks like a lounge chair. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean, okay? You see this is ghost buster. So that's basically like a nerve root. You've got an anterior tubercle, you've got posterior tubercle. You know, we, we like imaginative uh, figures and we like to remember that's how our brain remembers. So if you try to articulate something like this when you're scanning, you will remember it better. So this figure shows you C6 transverse process. You've got your anterior tubercle, you've got posterior tubercle, and you've got nerve root. And this is the needle showing how the, the cervical uh, sort of C6 uh, extra pyramidal uh, injections being performed. And you can see all the other structures. You can see the carotid artery. And, uh, you know, it's, so the ultrasound is a good way to actually diagnose, not diagnose, the, uh, perform this procedure at the right level. So C6 is that's what how we would uh, sort of scan. 
In opposition to C6, C7, as I said, only has a post trade tubercle. So as I call this as a, as a lounge chair position. So, you know, you have the post trade tubercle and then there's no entry tubercle. So look at this shape here and you have to just imagine the shape here. And this is where you put post trade tubercle. You've got C7 nerve root, you've got vertebral artery. And uh, this is this is the important structure to, 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 to visualize because if you're performing this procedure under x-rays, and then you put the ultrasound probe back and then you know inject the local anesthetic and steroid uh, slowly. So that's the ultrasound guarded uh, cervical nerve root block. And uh, this, is an, uh, this is another image showing you that, you know, you can pick up these feeding arteries to the nerve root or the radicular arteries. It's basically, you could see there are two branches here. Uh, you can see that they actually, the, the, the feeding vessel up very, very closely hugging to the, to the nerve root. So that's the anterior tubercle, that's the posterior tubercle. So uh, it's very important to actually pick up these vessels and you can avoid the damage to these vessels if you use ultrasound to perform the extra foraminal injection because you know with the fluoro you might have gone through the vessels you won't know until you inject the dye so it's very important to keep that in mind okay so let's move on to the third occipital nerve block and cervical medial branch so you know we do perform this um, we have been performing this with the x-rays but you know there are challenges with the x-rays a lot of times you will have patients with a large shoulder uh, sometimes you'll have a patients with very very degenerative neck and you might not be able to sort of, you know, uh, see the structures. And I think ultrasound uh, used in combination with uh, fluoro improves your success, uh, as well as, you know, you can actually perform these diagnostic blocks in the outpatient settings. And uh, so let's, let's start with this cervical medial branch. So, you know, this is what you look for. You put the ultrasound probe on the lateral aspect of the neck, and then you basically look for what we call it's the peak and trough peak and trough, and this is basically the cervical facet joint, and you have got your, at the first nerve that's located at the top of the peak is the third occipital nerve, and you've got C3 medial branch, that's your C3 joint, C3, C4 joint, and you've got C4 medial branch there uh, underneath the investing fascia of splenius capitis. So this is what you look for, cervical sort of, you know, of, of zygofacial joint. Uh, you will put your ultrasound probe, and you will scan anterior and posterior, and this is what you're looking for. Okay, peaks and troughs, right? So this basically the peaks are where you will find the, find the facet joints and the troughs are where you will find the medial branches, okay? Now, is this a validated technique? Yes, it is. Uh, Urs Eisenberg uh, from Switzerland back in uh, 2016 actually published this paper, uh, which was a, 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 a study where we, they used the ultrasound and they, they located the needle and then they did the x-ray and correct fluoroscopy position was confirmed in 82% injections. It's actually a, a very good success rate uh, using, the, uh, using the ultrasound. The other technique is once your needle is actually in the position, you can turn the probe and you can check whether your needle is parked on the top of the articular pillar. So this is the paper from Finlayson uh, back in 2012 and another paper from Mike Goffel. Uh, so, you know, they have shown successfully performing this uh, block, uh, cervical medial branch block using ultrasound. Uh, another technique that you could do is the Korean technique where you can actually use the in-plane technique and you can inject the medial branches or you can inject the, uh, inject the uh, cervical facets. Uh, you know, you can use a curvilinear probe and uh, then you can perform this uh, procedure uh, with one view with multiple injections. So some cautions, you know, you can get a similar kind of picture uh, of a cervical kind of medial branch uh, pattern uh, when you actually two anterior. So similar picture can be seen at the transverse process level and there is a danger of the transpyramidal needle insertion. So give up if you do not clearly see any bony structures. I prefer to do this procedure out of plane. Uh, I use a 25 gauge needle, so you don't need to use longer needles, you know, in the neck. So 25 gauge needle, and you just take, I mean, I use a lignocaine, five cc's of lignocaine, I inject half a cc of lignocaine uh, each, each, each medial branch. So, uh, and you know, you, when you inject the local anesthetic under site, you, you will see the fascia being lifted, and you know that you're actually depositing the local anesthetic, uh, uh, you know, next to the medial branch. 
Okay, so that's uh, the cervical medial branch. So let's uh, moving on to the posterior part of the cervical spine. Uh, this is the uh, the paper from Professor Bernard Morigal and Manfred Greger, uh, which actually showed the sonographic visualization of the greater occipital nerve block. Now, greater occipital nerve block is an excellent block for various uh, conditions, including tension headaches, uh, migraine, occipital neuralgia, a post dural puncture headache, you know, uh, my colleague here in Leicester, uh, Neeraj Gopinath has done a lot of studies on, on uh, uh, post dural puncture headache and the greater occipital nerve block. So you can actually elegantly do this procedure with full, safe, full safety, you know, uh, you can use the ultrasound and there are two approaches being described. This was the, this was, this is a proximal approach and this is a distal approach. This is a classic approach when we felt for the greater occipital protuberance and the mastoid process and people did blind kind of fan-shaped injection in that area, but you don't need to do that. If you use ultrasound, you can pick up a greater occipital artery. The nerve usually is basically next to it. And uh, I'll show you a few more pictures. And this is the proximal approach uh, where you would actually start to scan at the back of the head. And then you move down and look for the bifid spinous process at C2. And then you move the probe that it points towards the mastoid. And then you look for these particular structures. So basically, this is this is what you showed. The traditional approach here is the is the greater occipital artery uh, in this picture. You see, and then the greater occipital nerve is basically next to it. And you can use the in-plane technique to to target the the nerve at at the distal approach of the of the of the uh, of the greater occipital nerve. The proximal approach is a novel target where you're looking for this muscle called obliquus capitus inferior. And then you see this is semispinalis capitus and you, you actually uh, you know, very nicely pick up the artery along with the nerve in this area. And you can bring in the needle either out of plane or in plane and you can target this nerve quite, quite nicely and quite accurately. So what I mean, boat shaped muscle, this is the boat shaped muscle and you're looking for this particular area. Yeah, so basically this is the area looking for, this is the lamina of the spine and you have your obliquus capitis inferior and the nerve is sandwiched between the semispinalis capitis and obliquus capitis inferior. And you can do pulsed RF, you can do the nerve block uh, quite nicely in this region. Okay, so take home messages from the cervical spine. Uh, it is feasible to use ultrasound. Uh, extra foraminal injections may produce transforaminal spread and may be considered under ultrasound guidance. So as I said, you are performing the procedure uh, with the ultrasound. And if you're, to if you're talking about the uh, nerve root block, you're actually not getting into the root. You are extra foraminal, you're not in the foramen. Okay, so you can use the ultrasound safely for, for the cervical uh, sort of nerve roots. Now, transferaminal injections, don't do it. I won't do it, you know, if, because uh, the chances of complications are very, very high, unless you have a very, very good imaging like CT guidance. So, so as I said, cervical medial branch blocks, yes, ultrasound is, a very, is maybe an alternative to fluoroscopy for diagnostic block and decide on individual basis because sometimes if you have a very chunky neck and if you're not sure about the anatomy, then you, know, you, you, you may have to resolve to, to fluoroscopy. So yes, cervical medial branch and the facet joints and the third occipital nerve, you can use ultrasound. Uh, RF, you know, I won't just perform a radio frequency solely under ultrasound. You can use uh, ultrasound as, as an adjunct, and I call this as a hybrid technique where you can use ultrasound and x-rays both together to perform this procedure. Now, practical recommendations for cervical spine. This is not the region to start using a learning ultrasound guided intervention. So start easy, as I said, start with things like trigger points, nerves of the upper extremities, your study, get comfortable with the applied anatomy, uh, be reasonable while performing the block, you know, stop if you don't feel comfortable. If you feel that, you know, the anatomy is not right, if you are not sure what structure you're looking for, you know, and then, you know, you just sometimes have to back off and you use, you, you use what you're comfortable with. So, okay, so let's move on to the shoulder of Pallium MSK, uh, acromioclavicular joint, subacromial subdeltoid bursa, glenohumeral joint, and suprascapular nerve. These are the structures that we'll talk. And these can be very, very accurately performed using the ultrasound. And if you ask uh, uh, shoulder region, ultrasound is basically the imaging technique. Uh, you know, people used to do x-rays 
MRI scan, but nowadays everybody does dynamic scanning of the shoulder to pick up the rotator cuff tears, labral cyst, labral tears. It's an excellent tool. So acromioclavicular joint, a very, very simple in injection to perform. Uh, this was, these were performed blindly, uh, you know, but having said that, sometimes you have a high likelihood of going, going through, and this is, the, this is the picture showing acromion process, clavicle, this is your acromioclavicular joint capsule, and you've got your supraspinatus muscle here. And these are very, very superficial structures. And if you don't use ultrasound, you know, how do you know you've not gone into either a bursa or a supraspinatus muscle? So if you don't see it, how would you be, you know, sure about, about the accurate placement of the needle? So it's very well validated. Subacromel subdural bursa. This is the largest bursa in the body. It's located underneath the acromion process and coracoacromial ligament and deltoid muscle. And what are the indications? You would do them for subacromial impingement, partial or full thickness rotator cuff tear or rotator cuff tendinopathy. How would you perform this? Is you basically will put the ultrasound probe you know, ask the patient to do this work with a modified cross position. So if you see this image and this image, you are bringing the supraspinatus tendon out and from underneath the acromion and you can see the bursa quite nicely. So this basically the, 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 the area between these two lines is the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So that's deltoid, this is the uh, humerus and you have a supraspinatus muscle. And you can pick up tears. So this is, you can see the nice fibrillary line straight going across, so, you know, you can actually pick up the tears if this structure is basically disturbed or you can pick up calcification. So ultrasound is a great tool in the shoulder region. Glenohumeral joint, now we, we know the glenohumeral joint capsule, obviously it's extending, you know, the bicep tendon enters into the capsule. You have the extension into the axilla. Uh, so sometimes people who have a lot of effusion, they can develop swelling in the axilla. So it's not the lymph node, it's actually the capsule extending into the axilla. So how do we perform this procedure? You will perform this. Uh, I use the posterior approach to the glenohumeral joint. So you have supraspinatus muscles. This is a scapular spine, infraspinatus muscle. And you put the probe underneath the scapular spine. And basically, this is what you would do. And you will sort of, you know, look for the structure. Uh, this is your glenoid labrum, glenoid cavity, humeral head. This is a fibrocartilage. And you can bring the needle in nicely under real time guidance without touching the labrum. You can actually inject the local acid in steroid and it will flow into the capsule. So this is what it shows. Here you go. So the, the, the fluid going and spreading medially. Moving on to suprascapular nerve block, and I will tell you the updates in this field now. So suprascapular nerve block, you can actually perform this under ultrasound guidance. You put the probe on the scapular spine, you move forward, you look for the suprascapular fossa. And if you keep a bit moving forward, then you can sometimes pick up the notch. And this is where the, the suprascapular nerve along with the artery and the vein are coming out. So basically, you know, you can pick up the blood vessels uh, next structure target would be the axillary nerve. Now, in my practice, I do target axillary nerve and the suprascapular nerve both at the same time. Now, I would say, you know, why? Because we know 70% of innervation is suprascapular nerve. But what about the other 30%? And, you know, and how would you know that particular person doesn't have a high, higher innervation from the axillary nerve? So you do need to keep that in mind that, you know, when you come across a patient with shoulder pain, especially with the rotator cuff tear, you know, targeting suprascapular nerve alone, you, you, you are more likely to get failure because if you don't target the axillary nerve uh, and on also lateral pectoral nerve, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and also target the muscle trigger points because these patients guard their shoulder. They will always have the shoulder kind of, you know, in the guarded position, they'll have a trapezius pain. So I do suprascapular nerve block, axillary nerve block, and the trapezius trigger points all in the same sitting. And, you know, you will find your success rate will go up. Okay, so... So what do you do after diagnostic block? You look for the reduction in the pain scores. You look for the improved movements. You look for the shoulder function. You know, there is an Oxford shoulder score. Uh, and we actually, in our practice, try and see whether that has improved. And you also ask the patients, how, how were you able to sleep better? 
people who have shoulder pain, it's a very, very common complaint that they can't lie on their side where the pain is on all the shoulder. So, you know, it's this patient satisfaction. If the thing that, you know, they, they find the block has helped, then you can move on to the radio frequency. Now, what are the options? We've always been doing pulse tariff of suprascapular nerve, pulse tariff of axillary nerve, but uh, the update is, and I've highlighted that in red, is the conventional RF of suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve, and the lateral pectoral nerve. So this is the update that I was going to tell you in this field. So you can actually target these nerves. And I have put some fluoro fluoroscopic images here. So basically, this is the image for the, for the uh, suprascapular branches. Uh, you can actually uh, use a hybrid technique, which we have dis described, uh, which is currently being written up, and we will be submitting that shortly. But you can use the ultrasound to pick up the, the glenoid uh, cavity and then the glenoid process, and you can well, you know, park your needles under ultrasound guidance, and then you can do the x-ray to save the images. So this will be the target for the, for the suprascapular. This will be the target for the axillary. And then you can actually use the anterior x-ray, the AP x-ray to target the lateral pectoral nerve. And you can do conventional R RF. You've heard it right. It's a conventional RF not the pulsed RF, so you can go up to 80 degrees and you can actually do the radio frequency for the articular branches of all three nerves, both under hybrid technique of ultrasound and x-ray guidance. So, you know, these are, these are the tips, you know, patients in prone position, till the C-arm, uh, quad at 20 degrees. So if you're doing entirely with fluoro, I don't do entirely with fluoro. We do, I do hybrid technique, as I said, but, uh, you know, you can perform bipolar region or you can perform the lesion using a cool radio frequency or a trident needle. So just zooming onto those images. So this is the target for the suprascapular articular branch. This is a target for the axillary article branch. So this is basically like your knee, knee geniculus. So you look for the junction of the shaft and the condyle. So this is basically shaft and then the condyle. And this is where you will park your needle and you will perform a bipolar lesion if you don't have old RF or a trident. This is the lateral pectoral nerve, which you will but target at the coracoid process, not at the tip of the coracoid process, but the lateral, inferolateral uh, region of the coracoid process. So shoulder procedures, ultrasound is a great, great tool. Now let's move on to the abdomen and pelvis. Now this is the area I think ultrasound has changed so much uh, in terms of the management. In the past, people used to do blind trigger point injections. You know, treatment of acne was very difficult because you didn't didn't exactly knew you couldn't actually locate the 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 trapping of the nerve. So acne or acne is an abdominal uh, cutaneous nerve entrapment syndrome. Uh, it usually it, uh, happens at the lateral border of the rectum muscle and you can use the ultrasound. So in the past, people used to do this uh, feel and they used to do blind uh, you know, injection or not blind, but anatomy landmark guarded injection. But you can actually now use ultrasound uh, to your advantage and you can pick up the, the neurovascular bundle. And sometimes you can see the scar tissue. Patients have had a previous surgery. You can see the scar tissue and you can do hydro release. You can use 5% dextrose uh, to actually release the nerve. And, you know, you don't even need to sort of use too much of local. Just do hydro dissection with 5 percent dextrose and five percent dextrose is trpv1 receptor antagonist so you know hydrolocation and hydrodissection with five percent dextrose can be very good way to help these patients uh, with acne so this is a paper that's highlighting the treatment of acne using the ultrasound guided uh, uh, sort of injection so this is what you would do you would look for the uh, look for the junction of the of the rectus muscle this is the image that's showing you sort of, you know, junction. This is the linea semilunaris area. The needle is coming down and you've got, you've got internal oblique. You've got transverse abdominis and you can bring the needle in and you can do a targeted injection under ultrasound guidance. Okay. You can perform rectus sheet block. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, the abdominal pain patients are the patients who, have, who are actually on a revolving door phenomenon. They get, they, they get discharged, they come back, they get discharged, they come back. You know, and I think everybody looks for the uh, visceral cause of abdominal pain. A lot of people forget the abdominal wall as a, as, as a cause for the abdominal pain. And I think we all should actually examine the patients if they have garnet sign, if they have trigger points, you know, try and treat that. And, you know, you will find that it, you know, it gives you excellent results. So 
Another structure to target uh, with the ultrasound is iling one aloha hypogastric nerve. Uh, this is basically the picture showing you, you park the probe at the uh, highest point on the iliac crest, start at the ASIS, move back two fingers breadth, and you will see the iling one hypogastric nerves quite nicely sandwiched between your transverse abdominis and your internal oblique muscle. That's your external oblique. And you know, the, the beauty of this is you can do pulse radio frequency treatment of that plane, or you can actually stimulate individual nerve and you can do pulse radio frequency of the individual nerve. I do pulse radio frequency five minutes, uh, two cycles, so total 10 minutes. And uh, sometimes if you have a patient who have had a previous surgery and if you have anatomy anomaly, you know, you can hydrodiseck that area using 5% dextrose or lignocaine, and then you can perform your pulse radio frequency of the plane. So moving on, pudendal neuralgia, we know that this is basically a kind of, you know, an area where we've been using x-rays and, you know, and pudendal nerve can be entrapped at various levels. It can be entrapped to the sciatic notch, ischial spine, it can be, you know, uh, entrapped uh, along with association of and, and spasm of the obturator internus, or it can be entrapped at its terminal branches. And we've been using x-rays. And I remember when I was a trainee, uh, I got taught this. Uh, you look for this triangle uh, by tilting the probe, and then you try and go down, touch the bone, and then go through and feel for that, you know, feeling through going through cheese feeling kind of, you know, and, uh, you know, you ask the patient, do they feel any pins and needles or paresthesia in their private parts, and, you know, and then you inject the local acid steroid. You actually don't need to do any of that. You know, you can use, you know, this is what we did, but you can use ultrasound to do real time scanning, looking for the ischial spine, and then you can see sacrospinous ligament and sacrotuberous ligament very nicely. And that cheesy feeling was basically going through the ligament. So, you know, you can park the needle nicely between these two ligaments under ultrasound guidance, and you can pick up the internal pudendal artery and the nerve accompanies the internal pudendal artery. So if you deposit the local anesthetic between these two ligaments, you will get the block, no brain. You inject about five cc's of local, you will get the block. Right, uh, Sunil, are we okay with the time? Sunil? Yeah, we are okay with time, yeah. Fantastic. 10 minutes. So, great. So, lumbar spine, and now a lot of people ask me, like, you know, lumbar spine, do we use ultrasound for lumbar spine? It all depends on what kind of patients you have in your practice. If you have a patient who has a low BMI, and if you can pick up the structures nicely, yes, you can perform the facet joints, you can perform the medial branches using the, uh, the ultrasound. But... With, the, uh, with regards to the high BMI patients, patients with scoliosis, quite a lot of degenerative changes, it can become very challenging. So I'm just showing you in lumbar spine, when you put the ultrasound in the spinous process, ultrasound doesn't go through the bone. So you will have all that, what I call is nothing view, you know, spinous process, lamina, lamina. But when you move down in the interspinous space, the interspinous ligaments will allow the ultrasound to go through and it will give you this, what I call a two-step shadow. So this is a step one and then this is a step two. So that's a transverse process, superior article process, inferior article process. Between that two, you can bring the needle in and you can perform a facet joint injection. To do the medial branch block, the target will be slightly different, same view, but you will bring the needle in and you will park between the SAP and the transverse process. And then you will do a longitudinal scan to make sure your needle is on the top of the transverse process and you can perform the medial branch blocks. So this is what it is showing you, you know, the interspinous view, you've got ligament of labrum, uh, you've got your posterior longitudinal ligament, and then you have, you can actually pick up the pedural space, but this is just showing you superior article process, transverse process nicely, and this is the target for the medial branch as I mentioned earlier on. So lumbar facet joint and the medial branch block in thin, slim individuals uh, with, with sort of you know, good imaging, you can perform using ultrasound. Sacroiliac joint. I would say, why would you perform sacroiliac joint with the ultrasound if you can perform very easily with the x-rays? I think the indication I see for this technique is patients uh, in pregnancy who develop sacroiliacus and you don't want to expose them to x-rays. And I've actually performed uh, three patients uh, who, you know, 
I didn't want to you know, expose them to x-ray. I consented them. I told them about the use of steroids, use of local anesthetic. And you know, after discussion with the patient, we did perform this procedure in lateral position. They don't need to go prone either. So that's another advantage. You can use ultrasounds. You start at the PSIS, posterior superior iliac spine. Then you move down, you look for S1, you look for the S2. Usually at the level of S2, you will see the joint opening up and you can actually bring the needle in plane medial to lateral or out of plane and you can park your needle in in the sacroiliac joint region and you don't need to use dye you don't need to use x-rays and you can perform this procedure uh, procedure very accurately with the ultrasound so sacroiliac joint injections yes you know uh, ultrasound is a good tool to use Piriformis is another muscle, you know, and uh, this is another question to ask. We have been using x-rays to do piriformis injection. Every time you target a structure, you want to ask, is this structure a soft tissue, a nerve, or a bone, or a joint, okay? And then you decide which modality of imaging you're going to use. Piriformis injection is, uh, is, piriformis is a muscle, it's a soft tissue structure. Why to use x-rays to perform this procedure? So this is just showing you the, the ultrasound kind of, you know, uh, imaging technique. You start at the ileum, you move down, you look into the greater sciatic foramen and piriformis is the only muscle that starts from the inner side of the sacrum and goes on to the greater trochanter. So position A, showing you the straight line, what I call it as a mountain, then you move down and then you look for the break in the mountain. The break in the mountain is basically your, your sort of you know, greater sciatic foramen, and you can actually see the piriformis muscle. Beauty of this procedure is you can target various trigger points in the piriformis. You can inject Botox very accurately. You can prevent the sciatic nerve, a kind of, you know, palsy uh, by, because of your local anesthetic injection, because you can precisely put low volume local anesthetic and prevent the spread onto the sciatic nerve. You may sometimes still get a sciatic nerve spread, but you can avoid that by you know, targeting it accurately in the piriformis muscle. So piriformis injection with the ultrasound guidance is, is, a, is a very, very good procedure to do. Quadral epidural. So I'm just gonna run through and show you a few more images. Sacral cornu, what I call is a frog's eye sign, sacral cornu, sacral cornu. You have got your sacrococcygeal membrane and you can basically perform this as an out of plane or in plane. You can sometimes pick up blood vessels in very thin individuals. So, you know, you can, you know, prevent the damage to them. But why to use ultrasound for the caudal? This is just showing you the picture, uh, ultrasound imaging. You know, you, you can park it in plane real time. And then, you know, I do it as a hybrid technique because once you needle is past the bone, you won't be able to see anything. And you need to know, is your needle actually in the blood vessels. The only way to know that is use a fluoro along with the dye. So I will put the needle in using the ultrasound, then I'll do a fluoro with half a cc of dye, make sure the dye is still in the caudal space, and then I'll inject the local anesthetic and steroid. So that's that. Hip joint quickly running through for lower limb MSK. You know, hip joint injection can be very, very nicely performed using the ultrasound. And uh, what you need to do is basically locate the probe in the groin. So you can do it two ways. You can actually scan like you would scan for the femoral uh, nerve block. You can put the probe like that and then you tilt the probe and you align it at the junction of the head and neck. And you can actually look for what I call this as a, a head and neck junction where you have all these muscles. You've got your iliosos muscle there. You've got your sartorius muscle in that on the top and you can bring the needle in. You don't need to go to the labrum because a capsule extends all the way to the head and neck junction. So you can actually put the local, you can, you can bring the needle in, uh, in plane real time and you can perform this procedure. You don't need to you use x-rays at all. You can perform this procedure under ultrasound guidance. It's another schematic diagram. And this is another thing that tells you why ultrasound is advantageous. You can prevent the injury to the blood vessels like circumflex femoral artery, okay? Because a lot of times patients who have hip joint injections, what happens is they develop hematoma, they develop bruising in the groin. Why? Because, you know, this artery got damaged. Okay, or it came into the path. So this is why using the ultrasound, you can actually change your trajectory of the needle and you can accurately park the needle either up there 
or down there, and you can prevent the damage to the to the to the blood vessel. So hip joint, yes, you know, great place to use ultrasound. Greater trochanter pain syndrome, another great place to use ultrasound, and you can diagnose so many things: calcifications of the of the tendons using the ultrasound. This is another picture showing you. You can park your needle on the top of the greater trochanter. And you look for these structures. So what I call is the garage house sign or the, you know, the top of the, of the greater trochanter. You've got the anterior facet and you've got the lateral or posterior facet. And, you know, you've got gluteus minimus tendon here, gluteus uh, medius tendon here. And the top of that will be your subgluteus maximus bursa. So you can perform the ultrasound guided greater trochanter uh, trigger, uh, you know, bursa injection. And there are multiple bursae. So I would target subgluteus minimus, subgluteus medius, and the subgluteus maximus bursa, all the bursae in one sitting. Because sometimes if you just do the injection here, patient will not come, you know, the patient might not get a good success from the injection. So Hip joint RF, this is an update uh, with regards to the hip joint RF. You know, the uh, uh, positions that you will see here, you can perform this procedure in hybrid technique using ultrasound and x-rays and ultrasound prevents the injury to the blood vessels. So I'm just gonna quickly run through this. This is a position, you start at the anterior superior iliac spine, move the probe down, you look for the anterior inferior iliac spine. Once you see the anterior inferior iliac spine, you turn the probe in this position and what we look for is the iliopubic eminence, okay? And you can look for the source tendon and the, the pericapsular nerve group block that has been described is basically underneath the source tendon. You can actually bring the needle, you can put the needle here, that becomes your articular branch of femoral nerve. And uh, this is what it's showing you. Let me just go back. Articular branch of femoral nerve. And if you bring the needle and park in here, that becomes your accessory obturator branch of the uh, obturator nerve. So just showing you these pictures. Another uh, sort of you know, nerve to target will be the obturator nerve. And this is what the position of the probe would be. And this is the inferior part of the acetabulum. And the beauty of ultrasound, because you can look all these structures and you can direct the needle, and then you can do the X-ray just to save the images. So this is the obturator branch. You start like you would do for the hip joint. Position one is the hip joint, you know, and then position two, looking at the hip joint and then moving the probe you know, uh, towards medially and looking for the, you know, the, the inferior acetabulum and you can bring the needle in and park there and then you can actually do the uh, x-ray. So, you know, it, it corresponds with the, with the uh, teardrop. Knee joint, we know knee joint injections, you know, the uh, lateral axis uh, to the uh, uh, suprapatellaresis is a commonly performed injection with the ultrasound. Uh, and it is very useful to perform this in a high BMI patient because you can pick up the rhesus very accurately. How would you know you've injected the local acidic and steroid in the fat? You know, because the patients have a high BMI, you might not feel anything. So that's where I would use the ultrasound. Uh, and, you know, ultrasound is becoming a standard for majority of the joint injections now. So knee joint injection can be very nicely performed. Genicular nerve block is another procedure that we perform. And, you know, the, we have superomedial, inferomedial, and superolateral genicular nerves. These are the branches of the, of the saphenous, uh, uh, sort of not saphenous femoral, uh, as well as obturator nerves. Uh, and uh, you can perform these under ultrasound guide. And just showing you the picture here, you can actually put the probe on the junction of the shaft and the condyle, you will pick up the blood vessel and that's the nerve and you can target these nerves very accurately using the ultrasound. You can perform the radio frequency treatment. Lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh, this is another procedure. I think in the past people just did a fan-shaped injection in this area, but you can use the ultrasound. So showing you sartorius tensor fascia latra, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, just located in what do they call it the fat-filled flat tunnel. And you can bring the needle in nicely. You can park the needle and you can perform this procedure very accurately. So you can tell the patient technically I perform the right block and you will find the patient will come, you know, tell you that the, the pain, the burning sensation that they get uh, post block will go down. So lateral femoral chest nerve, plantar fascia going down to the toe now towards the uh, ankle and the toe area, plantar fascia injections. So this is the area where people have performed blind injections in the past, but if you're using uh, stuff like platelet-rich plasma, I think ultrasound is must because you want to deposit the active substance in the right area. You can see the calcaneum and the top of that will be the plantar fascia. You can do 
the injection very accurately in the plantar fascia. A lot of times people do peppering of the fascia. So you will do dry needling to actually make the small, small holes. And then you can actually put a PRP, platelet-rich plasma, in order for the fascia to heal. So plantar fascia injection and the first MTP joint, this is basically coming to the toe now, very accurately performed under ultrasound guidance. You can actually see the effusion in the joint. Uh, so basically this is, bas this is showing you the picture and metatarsophalangeal joint. Sometimes you can pick up, you know, neovascularization if the joint is inflamed. Uh, so it's not only just for the therapeutic purpose, you can actually use this for, for diagnostic purpose. And a lot of rheumatologists now use ultrasound to diagnose synovitis and arthritis. Okay, so MTP joint uh, is what you would use. Uh, the first MTP joint, you can accurately use ultrasound. So in summary, ultrasound guided injections are cost effective. They improve safety. It is a point of care, diagnostic and, uh, and therapeutic interventional tool. Uh, it is portable. You can do live dynamic scanning, but it is operator dependent and the training is needed. So acknowledgements, uh, these are my gurus, mentors, colleagues, friends, you know, uh, Bernard Murugal, uh, he's a professor of anatomy in Austria, and I've learned a lot and lots of ultrasound from him. And these are the other people who've been my uh, mentors in the various parts of the world. So uh, just on that note, in regards to the training, uh, guys, we are actually launching what we, what we call the state of art virtual pain course series. Uh, we have faculty from various parts of the world. We have practical content, skeleton anatomy, applied anatomy, radiology, and ultrasound made easy live demos. And now it's, everything is going virtual. And we thought that how can we actually provide a good quality content uh, to our to our to our sort of you know to our sort of viewers. So it's a combined kind of uh, course between Leicester Pain Education and Gulf Pain School. We're starting with the spine virtual course in December. Uh, we have a upper limb MSK course in January and lower limb MSK course in February. So we have three courses sort of, you know, and they are in series. There are like three, three part series or four part series. But yes, if you want to know more about it, go onto the Gulf Pain School website. Uh, we, we are on Facebook and LinkedIn and we will put the updates on that shortly. If you need more information about the courses, then drop an email to gulfpainschool at gmail.com. And uh, with that note, uh, thank you so much. I have ran about 10 minutes for my time. I'm so sorry, guys. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sunil. Thank, well you, thank you, Sadiq, for the excellent presentation. Uh, there is actually a comment on the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful pictures, excellent presentation. Thank you. Revolution through ultrasound has allowed me to continue RF treatments in a day surgery setting. The other thing I have found is that people tolerate ultrasound guided interventions much better Absolutely. than the floro approach. Yeah. My question for you is like, you know, what are the challenges you want to do ultrasound guided procedures in a day, day, uh, day case kind of? Uh, so in period? terms of the day surgery, you yeah. first thing I think, you know, you would like to use a word called as clean room. We perform this in a clean room. So yeah. the, 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 the area needs to be sort of, you know, checked and the surveillance needs to be done by an IP. Okay, the infection control department needs to come and look at area. There shouldn't be any carpets, should be hard flooring. Okay, so that's basically you need to have someone to assist you. So someone to drop the drugs and syringes and needles. Okay, you do need a good quality ultrasound machine. Uh, basic ultrasound machine. I'm not saying like the ultrasound machine that radiologists use. No, no, no. You can actually use a laptop style machine. And, uh, you know, uh, and that's it. Basically, you, you and patient needs to be uh, able to position themselves. So, because sometimes, you know, we have patients who can't position. So, you know, and if you are talking about the outpatient based uh, procedure, you need to actually uh, make sure that the, you know, the turnover flows, the flow goes on in terms of list. If you have patients who find difficult to position themselves, then we usually bring them in a day case uh, okay. setting. So, you know, those are the things I think I would say challenge wise, you know, it's, Easy to implement, but you need to have infection control team coming and saying, you know what, okay, you can perform the procedure in this area to, to sign off, basically. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay, now, uh, moving on to our next presentation. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Steve. Uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Katie Knott. Uh, 
uh, she, uh, a senior clinical psychologist, and uh, it's a joint presentation, and also by Mr. Grevin Jones, who is a clinical specialist physiotherapist, and uh, uh, other speaker is uh, Miss Ruth Burgess. She's a clinical nurse specialist. The topic of the presentation is transforming services to meet the demands of the COVID-19 pandemic. Katie not unfortunately can't uh, uh, present her in today's meeting, but Mr. Grevin Jones and then uh, uh, Ruth, Miss Ruth Burgess, uh, uh, they can present it today. Yeah. Uh, on to the next presenters, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to say hi. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us. I'll just see if I can share my screen now and get this up. Ooh. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, then we'll begin. Okay. Um, okay. So just again, thanks. Thanks for having us and. Uh, Reiterating what's just been said that unfortunately Dr. Katie Knott can't be with us, so we wish her a speedy recovery. Um, and we've got a lovely, lovely sounding uh, uh, presentation, Transforming Services to Meet the Demands of a COVID-19 Pandemic, which is something that Katie Knott came up with. It's, in reality, it's really our, it's, it's our story, I suppose. It's, it's how we've coped during the pandemic and what we've had to try to do to meet the demands of, of what patients want, really. So the plan for this session is that we, we'll, we'll be talking for about 30, 35 minutes, and we'll have a brief look at our service here, uh, a little bit about the issues and difficulties that arose uh, during, obviously, uh, occurred for everybody during COVID, and how we looked at the solutions and approaches to deal with them at that particular time, where we're at at this present moment in time. And we're going to spend a little bit of time then, or, or Ruth is going to talk a little bit about our virtual PMP, because it seems to be uh, a, quite a contemporaneous issue at, at the moment, at this moment in time. So we'll probably spend a little bit of time going, going about how we've set up this virtual pay management programme. Uh, and then plans for the future post-COVID, or, or even just at this point onwards, and what we're looking at at this moment in time. So a little bit about our service pre-COVID. So we are, uh, we work in Betty Carvalhada, uh, which is essentially the whole of the north of Wales. It's the uh, largest uh, trust within North Wales. And our team consists of, or consisted of pre-COVID uh, two pain consultants, uh, one being full-time, uh, Professor Hag, and we had one part-time at that time uh, being uh, Dr. Sonia Pierce, who's, who's presenting today. Uh, we had uh, 1.6 pay nurses who are very experienced, not old, just experienced nurses. Uh, and we had 0.6 whole-time equivalent of clinical psychology, which we recognised was not really uh, enough for really to cope with the demands pre-COVID. Uh, and that's something that we're looking into at the moment. We had one band seven physio, which is myself, and we also had a full-time band six uh, uh, physiotherapist who was temporary at that time. And unfortunately, as COVID started, we lost him um, because his he was paid by uh, waiting list initiative money. And due to the relaxing waiting lists, we also lost the funding for our physio. We are probably, we are the smallest team as far as uh, amount of people working in, in our chronic and persistent pain team in North Wales. But we've got the largest population, really. We've got quite the, the largest urban areas, being Wrexham and Flintshire. Uh, we receive most referrals. And there's a lot of socioeconomic um, changes and difficulties within the areas, within the urban areas. But within that as well, we've got, you know, a vast area. Then even being the east part of Wales, we, we extend down to Dolgetlai as well, when they've uh, farming communities as well, where people had difficulty attending appointments prior to COVID. So we knew that problems existed prior to COVID. And then obviously uh, mid to late March, things changed. And we, we had to we had to really think about how we were going to evolve the service that we were providing. But the positive thing that we had was we just moved a few weeks 
prior to COVID happening to a, a larger room. So we were able to function on the people who remained within the service because we did lose our pain consultant uh, at that time. Um, but we were able to work within a room. We didn't have to, we could distance and work together as opposed to working from home, which I think would have probably held us back a little bit during that time. So we had a period then where we where we wanted to reflect on the service. Uh, what would we want really of service to look like? And you know, prior prior to COVID, we, we were recognizing that IT was going to be something that we would need to invest in. And then we had almost like this perfect storm occurring where all patients were using platforms. So all patients were, were teaching themselves to communicate via these uh, new ways. And although we recognize an up upgrade was necessary, it was difficult maybe to get the infrastructure in place to begin with, but we worked kind of diligently at that time to, to try to get as much as we could in, in, in a short period of time. We realized that there was IT training needed, but, but it didn't seem to exist. So we all, as we all have become almost many IT consultants uh, teaching ourselves how to use it. We recognized that it wasn't something that we could wait for. Uh, it's something that we had to be quite proactive in trying to achieve. We did spend some time benchmarking against other services, and that was other services within Wales and also uh, within England, and especially services uh, which had already instigated digital pathways. Um, and I think it's useful to benchmark as long as you're benchmarking against similar services, similar similar geographical areas, uh, it's not worth benchmarking against um, areas which have got huge amounts of resources. Uh, but if it's similar and similar areas, then it, it could be particularly useful, which we found. Um, we did get some help from industry, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and, and that involves some of the pilots and, and research we're looking into. And what was necessary at this point was good communication. And we had regular meetings, daily meetings, because things were changing so fast within our own service. But we also met up uh, Pan Betsy, Pan North Wales, and also within Wales. And we still have, as far as physio is concerned, uh, we still have uh, meetings with uh, the physios, clinical, clinical specialist physios working in pain throughout Wales, which has been fantastic where we're able to share our successes and hopefully not replicate our, our uh, periods when we haven't been as successful. Um, what we did re recognize early on, but it was really important because a lot of change in the service depended on, on admin being able to function as well. And we're lucky to have a, a very um, innovative, I would say, uh, admin team on board. Um, who have contributed to the process all the way through because we rely completely upon them to be able to create and, and, and um, then utilise these new clinics. So where are we at in this moment in time? Well, everybody, we made sure that everybody had a computer uh, and headset and camera and uh, telephone headsets as well. And we were able to do this by June. We, we carried on telephone clinics throughout the pandemic. Um, and we realized maybe initially that when we were validating waiting time or waiting lists, that if you asked the patient if they wanted to have a telephone consultation or wait for face-to-face, -face, then they would take a face-to-face. -face. Nobody realized that this uh, pandemic would, would take so long or is still taking so long. So we changed that. Uh, to more, um, what we informed patients that they would have a telephone call and we made appointments with uh, the individual clinicians to see patients so that we could discuss patient pathways, we could team up with other agencies and we could treat patients that existed within our service. We made sure we had a dedicated room for virtual consultations um, and that was particularly useful, although we have each one at our desk we just wanted to make sure that we had an element of, of privacy for the patients. 
We uh, also worked a lot with the comms team, which has been fantastic uh, during this time. And we create, we've created a YouTube site. We've uh, recorded content that we can share with patients to support them. And this is something that we're going to be continuing with in the future as well. Um, we validated all the waiting lists, updated all the patient information, all our standard operating procedures, which was a lot of work. And we were also an early adopter for the Attend Anywhere software, which has been on since August. We've been able to do daily virtual uh, clinics. Uh, we have completed our first 12-week virtual BMB, and we finished that in uh, October, started it in the summer, which was, uh, we, we felt very successful if not a little bit scary to begin with. And we're just going to talk a little bit about this in, in, uh, in the next few minutes. And we also continued the interventional service. And when we were able to, we were able to get or welcome Professor Hag back to our team, um, he's been working extremely hard to, to, to get our um, waiting list down, which we've been quite successful with. So at this present moment in time, despite COVID, we've been able to decrease weight for interventions, especially theatre-based interventions, which pre-COVID were about one and a half years uh, from referral to completion, and that's currently down to four months. Um, we've been able to decrease weights for our pain management programme by 40% pre-COVID to uh, this moment in time. And we've also decreased for patients in the service so all the patients that existed in our service, at this current moment in time, we've decreased the ones waiting for nurses down to uh, no waiting times. And for physio intervention, again, we don't have a waiting time at this current moment in time. We've got a few, I think we've got about 10 to 15, who are still waiting for face-to-face. -face. But this was a significant number prior to COVID. Uh, and this has allowed us now to increase the new patient uh, capacity. So we've increased patient capacity by 30%, despite losing some members of the team. And this was 30% increased ban pre-COVID as well. These being virtual at this current moment in time. Um, but we do recognise during this time, it hasn't been perfect in the respect that, although we've seen some new patients, this is significantly less than what we used to see um, uh, initially. Uh, and that's led to an increase of patients awaiting our service. Hopefully that will be addressed over these next few months now. I'm going to pass you over now just to Ruth, and she's going to talk a little bit about our pain management programme for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you, Gavin. So a um, little bit of background about um, pain management programmes in Wrexham. Uh, so before COVID, we would run three face-to-face -face programmes per year, and we would select 15 patients onto those programmes um, with the view that we would use to get some dropouts. So we'd have 10 to 12 patients on the programme um, in the end. Um, the average wait for our programmes were two and a half years, which is far too excessive. Uh, but unfortunately, we're only able to run three per year because of staffing. Um, we also recognise that 140 patients on the waiting list at any one time is not good. So the fact that we've been able to reduce that is, is, is fantastic. Um, our face-to-face -face program is usually over six hours um, on a weekly basis for nine weeks. And the team includes myself as a clinical nurse specialist, Grevin, the specialist physiotherapist, and Katie Knox, the clinical psychologist, um, who's unfortunately not here today. So, we, you know, we looked at kind of the referrals that were still coming in through COVID. And as pain management programmes are something we refer to a lot, um, you know, as the gold standard for managing pain, we didn't want our waiting times to get longer. Um, and that's why, you know, we kind of focused on, you know, setting up this virtual pain management programme um, as quickly as we could, really. So our thoughts around kind of, um, you know, doing a virtual programme was, you know, how could we deliver this? Um, was it something that we could do? Did we have the knowledge and expertise? Because none of us were particularly um, IT savvy um, pre-COVID. So, you know, that was a bit of a learning curve. Um, did we have the equipment and rooms? You know, yes, we all have our own computers now and um, we have access to some laptops. But ultimately, we felt it was better to have a, a VC equipment and a room where all three of us could be present at the same time. Um, we also wondered whether patients would be able to opt into the programme. 
as in would they want to do it? Would they have the necessary equipment um, to be able to do an online programme? Um, and the other aspect of, you know, would they have the same outcomes? You know, we didn't want to disadvantage people who were going to opt in for a virtual programme. Um, and I think that was a key point that we looked at, that we wanted to have the same contents for the virtual programme as we would do on a face-to-face on -face programme. But ultimately, you know, as Gordon said earlier, you know, something is better than nothing. We felt we needed to get up and running with it as soon as we could. Um, so we kind of just raced ahead with it. Identifying suitable patients, um, as Brevin has mentioned, you know, our admin team were very proactive from early on in COVID. Um, they validated the waiting list and asked all the patients if they would be able to and would want to um, attend virtual clinics and programmes. And we had quite a high uptake so for, from the pain management programme patients. About half, I think, kind of opted in to do virtual. Um, so, you know, that was quite, quite surprising from our perspective. Um, in relation to the, uh, the VPMP assessment clinics, now we always do an assessment clinic before somebody comes on a programme. And the reason about that is just to make sure they're fully informed about, the, about what the programme is. Um, we still have people who feel that a pain management programme is going to take their pain away. So it's about making sure they have the right information. And also because they've sat on our waiting list for two and a half years, we need to kind of recheck that they're in the right place, that you know, it's right for them at that moment. So we decided to set up some virtual assessment clinics. Um, and we thought this would also be good as a test run for us using virtual platforms and three um, assessment clinics. Our first assessment clinic was a bit of a shambles, really. Um, we only had five people able to get into the platform. Um, we had lots of people sitting in a virtual waiting area that we couldn't see, but we had lots of messages afterwards to say, you know, let, why didn't you let us in? Um, and, and actually, at one point, we even dropped out of the session because of the, um, the poor um, accessibility. So we decided from there on in that we would only put a maximum of eight patients on per virtual programme because we were going to have to use Skype. Um, but on a positive note, we did have enough patients opt in from the three assessment clinics to actually start a programme. So we then set about designing our programme. And again, I mentioned that we didn't want to disadvantage people. So we decided to run it over 12 weeks at 2.5 hours per week. And we would back this up with a weekly email sent out to patients, which would have um, links to YouTube videos, um, extra information, copies of our PowerPoint presentations, etc. Um, and we felt that this would meet the core standards for pain management in the UK for PMPs. All three of us were going to be present throughout. And again, that would help for us to develop our IT knowledge and skills. Um, but also, we know we needed to have one person as a designated IT person. So that person would let people into the waiting area, manage the chat function, um, so that whoever was presenting didn't have to worry about that. Unfortunately, yes, we had to go with Skype, uh, but we didn't have anything else. So that wasn't, um, you know, there was no alternative. Uh, we adapted lectures and presentations. So obviously, running pain management programs for many years, we've already got our lectures that we'd normally do. But over a virtual platform, they weren't as easy to do. And we felt the patients needed something to look at. So we did create more PowerPoints um, for the lectures, um, but didn't want to overburden people with PowerPoints either. We had pre-existing handouts, um, which we didn't adapt. They were for a nine-week programme, and they were a collation of Word documents that we've done over many years. Um, there was some feedback from patients that maybe that, that wasn't great because there wasn't page numbers in the booklet, and it was, it was put together as a nine-week handout. Um, so that's something we do need to alter. We developed a generic email for the Rex and Pain Clinic, which is something we didn't have pre-COVID, so the, the weekly emails could go out from, from that rather than our personal emails. And as Bevan mentioned, we filmed some videos, um, set up a YouTube channel with the idea that we would send out these links to specific videos for patients to watch, some of them being exercise videos, because uh, Bevan had had some thoughts about whether a live exercise session or activity session would be feasible uh, because we wouldn't necessarily be able to see all of the patients uh, participating in the exercises. Um, but actually, unfortunately, because the comms lady who filmed them for us, 
was a bit snowed under with work, didn't get them back to us in time. Um, so we actually had to do live um, activity sessions, which actually went really well. You know, the patients all participated. It was done safely. Um, and, and yeah, going forward, we will be using the videos, but maybe some live sessions as well. So day one of our program came and um, great, you know, all, partici uh, all participants attended and were able to get online. Unfortunately, the negative, they weren't able to stay online throughout the sessions. Uh, we had lots of dropouts. Um, so, you know, we decided after that session that you know, we, we couldn't really, it wasn't feasible to continue with Skype. Uh, fortunately, our psychologist had been granted access to Microsoft Teams the week before. Um, so we phoned all the patients, um, explained the reason for change, um, and sent out new links to them to log into Teams for the following week. So throughout the programme, predominantly the programme went well. Um, I would say no Teams, much improvements on um, Skype. The group engaged really well, which is something we weren't sure would happen. Um, on a virtual platform, but they, they created good friendships and support networks. They were chatting to each other, answering each other's questions, um, and, and that was really nice to see. We were worried, though, that because normally in a face-to-face -face program, um, they would normally chat over lunch and over coffee breaks, and they weren't getting that as much. Um, so we decided to suggest to them in about week four, I think it was, um, that maybe if they wanted to give each other their contact details uh, via the chat function, um, then they could link up outside of the pain management program. Um, and instantaneously, they all literally put their telephone numbers and um, emails into the chat box. Um, so that was great because we weren't having to manage the GDPR. They had done that themselves. Um, and one of the ladies set up a messenger group, which they kept in touch with throughout the week. And from the feedback we had, they found that valuable because they could kind of check with each other if they were unsure of anything or help each other out with the home practice, et cetera. Um, so again, the, the, no specific issues throughout the rest of the program, really, other than IT issues. So even with Teams, we did have um, two days where, because we were using a banking university login, when the universities went back in, our, our connection dropped dramatically and we were only able to see one person on Teams. So we did have to resort to using a laptop at that stage so that we could kind of see all of the patients at the same time. Um, great feedback from the group generally. They'd been, as we say, thoroughly engaging. They coped with the issues that we'd thrown at them and kind of we kind of laughed at it, you know, throughout the programme that we were all learning together. Um, from our perspective, we feel that, you know, we've become more proficient in lot online groups and eager to continue. Um, and again, the positive side that they created links, which is something we didn't think would happen. The not so good, so having to change the platform on week two, we weren't sure, obviously, but that was quite anxiety provoking, really, for the patients. And maybe for us, again, having to get used to a completely new platform that we'd not been able to practice on um, that much. We did have two patients drop out midway. Um, one lady was moving house and felt she couldn't cope with the demand of a programme and moving house. And the other lady had had IT issues throughout um, from the very beginning, which she hadn't been able to resolve, um, even with kind of us trying to talk her through things. Um, and she kind of disappeared around week five. And as I said, the other issues were IT related, really. Feedback from patients. Again, it comes back to the IT issues, but mainly when using Skype. Page numbers in the workbook, which I've mentioned. And I think the key one for us is you normally would send out psychometric scores and we do them at day one and day 12. Now, we did send those out, <coughs> excuse me, via the email. We didn't get a good response rate. And even though we chased that up kind of a couple of weeks into the program, um, I think because we were so focused on, you know, developing each session as we went along, really, um, we didn't kind of chase it up enough. So we didn't get the kind of get psychometrics back to compare the outcomes as well. And that's something that we need to be better at moving forward. Positives, <clears throat> all the patients found it very effective. They enjoyed the course. Um, two of them said they'd actually prefer, prefer a virtual appointment in the future. But actually, a lot of them, most of them would opt in for virtual because they didn't have to travel and they felt it was less anxiety provoking. We asked them about PowerPoint slides. because Again, we didn't want to overwhelm them with PowerPoint. So that was a key thing we wanted to know about. And actually, they all liked the use of PowerPoint because they felt there was something to look at rather than just looking at us. 
So some general comments, again, kind of, you know, they felt bad days. Um, it was easier to, because they didn't have to talk to people as much. One lady did go away on holiday and she was able to attend whilst away. And again, it was it, most of the comments were around kind of, it was easier to get to know people from my own home. It was less anxiety provoking. I didn't have to travel. I didn't have to worry about parking. And, and easier to talk about difficult issues when you're not sat next to somebody. There was only one real negative comment, and, and I don't even know if that's negative. Um, it was more about needing more in-depth explanation. Um, and I think that's one of the key things. You're trying to cram so much into you know, half an hour slots in those two and a half hours that you know, even though we'd made it over 12 weeks, we still felt like we were struggling sometimes to kind of fit the content in. So moving forward, um, ideally we'd love Zoom so we could have breakout rooms, which means you know, we could have more people on the group in total to be able to then have separate small groups. But as this isn't available, then you know, we've got to go with Teams. Um, that, that's what we've got. We would also like our own VC equipment, so we're not having to find rooms to run a program from. You know, we've looked now at equipment and we're putting a bid in for that. I've mentioned that we're going to update the workbook. That's happening as we speak. And we've actually um, planned our next programs. Uh, so we're going to run two per day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, and we've done um, a whole host of assessment clinics over the last couple of weeks. And again, we've got a really good uptake for, of patients for those. We have also, uh, Greville had mentioned about filming videos. So we've done an assessment clinic video. And the idea of this is to send it out to patients when they're first put on the waiting list. Um, so rather than them sitting on a waiting list for two and a half years to then decide, actually, no, I wasn't fully informed and this wasn't what I wanted, um, we would send it out to them. Um, and we're hoping that that will reduce the waiting list, but equally mean that the people coming to the programme will be more, um, more informed. So it will have a better amount of patients that are fully informed at the end. So I'm going to pass you back to Grevin now. He's going to talk a bit more about some other service developments um, that we've been doing throughout the last few months. So uh, this should, should have been a part that uh, Dr. Katie Knott was doing so she can shout to the screen if I'm doing this wrong. Um, so looking at where we're going to move from this point as well is that we're going to be obviously kind of um, implementing a lot of the innovative technology that we've already taken on. So we, we kind of uh, envisage that approximately about 50% of all our follow-ups are probably going to be virtual, even post-COVID at that point in, in, in time. Um, as Ruth was saying as well, using the group kind of um, uh, the group platforms as well that may change over time, but uh, hopefully we can uh, utilize uh, Zoom at, at a later stage as well. The next section now we can, we're talking about is hubs in a home pilot, and, and what I'll do is I'll combine that really with the, the point underneath, which was a, a health hack. Um, during uh, May, I think it was May of, of this year, we undertake, undertook a health hack, which was jointly done, uh, well, it was, was, was uh, uh, done by the Bevan Commission. Uh, and this we found to be particularly useful. Uh, it's a bit like Dragon's Den, so it's a little bit, um, it's a bit scary. You have to, you have to uh, uh, pitch what you want. And what was particularly useful is that, is that um, people would come then with solutions and especially people within uh, the tech business as well. And that's led to a pilot, uh, which we've been, uh, we received a research grant from our last to pilot uh, a concept which is called Hopes in a Home, where we're able to use, it's, it's almost like a fire stick really, which plugs into uh, the, the patient's or service user's TV. And we can use that as a portal then to communicate with the patient, but also send information down. And we see this as something that we're going to use to support our patients and possibly support pain management program as well. Through the Hubs in the Home as well, we've been developing links with research and development. Uh, and also uh, we've been, uh, we are about to undertake some clinical research as well which uh, has been something which Professor Hag has been working on, uh, where we uh, received a grant of just shy of £60,000, which will then be looking at biomarkers uh, uh, with, with pain and looking at interventions maybe affecting the biomarkers as well. 
what's been useful is by starting to provide these links with other people, we're then more confident and in access accessing funding. And, and that seems to be a, a continual process then where the more funding we're able to get, the easier makes our job and role as well. As far as resource development, we've also um, applied and been accepted for a Bevan Exemplar, which again is, is, is a fantastic resource that uh, that's we utilise in at the moment. And it's particularly looking at the resources that we're providing, if, if, if that's written or if that's within platforms or whether that's um, uh, within multimedia. And we're gathering qualitative data at the moment and we're looking at what works best for our patient uh, cohort, really. Um, we've also, within that, similar to what I was saying earlier, is we're developing kind of these information videos with the communication teams. And, and I suppose we've started from a position where we haven't gone for perfect by any stretch of imagination, but we've got a product out there which we can hopefully then uh, improve as time goes by. We're trying to improve service pathways and uh, we've been in talks about um, having links really with, with remote completion of PREMS and PROMS through the national database. And that could potentially then take out the outcome measure part uh, from us providing it, but then being provided it by an external, uh, an external agency. Um, and, and that hopefully will, then will imprint um, quality within our service a little bit more effectively. Um, we've also looked at automated triage and referral process by again, uh, an outside agency, but there would be a cost implication to that. Um, we've looked at uh, platforms to host a range of uh, pain self-management resources. And initially that was going to be, again, an external website. But we're thinking that after discussing with uh, uh, Endless and uh, Welsh Government, but due to the fact that we're going to be bringing out a health app in the not too distant future, that could be something which uh, we could use uh, throughout Wales to host uh, information for pain patients. Um, locally, though, we'll, we'll utilise our the new um, uh, web platforms coming out through Betsy Cadwallader. We've also been looking at different models to provide resources and interventions. And it, it's about maybe providing this earlier on in the journey. We've talked uh, on, on multiple occasions about pre-education. Uh, but we've been able to link with the EPP have been a, a great uh, assistance with us, so the Education for Patients program. And we're doing a project in January where they'll be offering uh, pain education for our patient uh, cohort, which will be bespoke and purely for them. So we're going to take 60 patients on, recently referred patients, and then we can assess uh, if that improves um, their ability to self-manage uh, if they require our service past that point as well. So that's, that's a, an interesting and exciting uh, thing that we're going to try in the new year. And also we're looking at uh, other pathways uh, similar to the IPAS, so integrating pain with our orthopedic triage, which is a clinical musculoskeletal assessment team. And the gold standard at that point was be to potentially be able to offer patients a biopsychosocial assessment within six to 12 weeks of referral. And I think this is the probably the most important thing that we've taken from everything that we've learned is that we, we'll be looking to co-produce all of our all of our pathways, all of our services, and all of our information with service users. And, and we're particularly lucky in this area in, in that we have four pain support groups which are independent uh, and support our patient uh, groups uh, and from discharge as well within the communities. And we, we work quite closely with them, although they are independent. And we've also got um, uh, what would be classed as uh, service experience champions from that as well. And that's where we're at at the moment. That's uh, a picture of us as we are at the moment as well. Uh, and uh, I'd like to say thank you for listening to us on, on our journey. And if there's any questions, that we find. I think for time, I think we've done quite well. <laughs> yeah, you're done well. Well done. <laughs> thank you, uh, Grevin and uh, 
uh, Ruth for your excellent presentation. Any questions from the floor, please? You can put it on the chat box. Right, okay. Uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, what is the biggest challenge you faced and how did you, how were you able to overcome? Because, I don't know, that's a difficult one. Uh, but there's so many. Uh, for me, I think it's doing kind of the bed and work because that's quite challenging. There's a lot of um, sessions that we need to attend as part of the Bevan, um, and that's trying to fit that in around work. But I think it's juggling everything, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and I think initially with, with patient care, it was instigating the pathways and doing the fiddly bits which, which needs to be done and being able to uh, combine that with our, with you know, with the rest of the team as well. I, I think that's, that's particularly difficult, but I think if it was that impetus to try and not be perfect to begin with, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure if I've ever been perfect, mm. but yeah. it's, you know, within that time, it's just about getting in there and doing it, I, I, I feel, which is maybe my approach in life anyway. <laughs> I mean, do you think the virtual uh, program are uh, as effective as, you know, the face, do you think they may be as effective as the face to face kind of? Uh, uh... I think so. I mean, the, the feedback we had from the patients and the, the group of patients we had were patients that had severe anxiety issues and quite significant mental health issues. Um, and these are some of that some of them said they would not have attended a face to face program, you know, so they would kind of discounted it from the outset, but actually been able to do it from their own home, even though it, that caused some anxiety. And, and the anxiety of kind of logging in and kind of staying on a platform, they embraced that because, you know, they thought, well, I'll give it a go. Um, and I think it did help that, you know, we were all kind of in the same boat, you know. Um, but, yeah, I, th I think I think it will. I think there's definitely a place for it. And even when we start doing face-to-face -face programs, we plan to still do virtual ones as well. Okay. Yeah. Because again, that two, sorry, I was going to say that 2.5 hours, you know, can fit in, people can fit that in easier around work. You know, and people don't want to sit in a program all day because pain patients say, I can't sit for that long. I couldn't possibly be out of the house for that length of time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But particularly the useful for was anxiety. Was yeah, there. yeah, definitely. Okay. There are two questions from the floor. Uh, the first question is, how have you managed to deliver a service to those patients who do not have internet access or unable to access an online PMP, please? Yeah. No. <laughs> I was just going to say, so yeah, I mean, obviously we've told patients, we've been up front with them and said, you know, we're not allowed, our management team have said we're not allowed to see patients face to face. So, you know, if, if this is your option, if you can opt in, to, if you can do a virtual program or attend a virtual clinic, then that's what we can offer you. But we can't offer you anything else at this moment in time. Um, and I think people have appreciated that. We haven't had a lot of people phoning up saying, oh, you know, when are you going to be seeing uh, patients on a face-to-face -face basis? Because we, we were up front with them from the beginning. Um, so, yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, it's difficult, um, but that's, that's as it is, isn't it? I, I think we recognise that there is a limitation at the moment, isn't it? And we're, we're looking at, um, we're, you know, bringing patients in on a face-to-face -face basis for those ones who, who can't access uh, virtual Obviously, we've still got the telephone um, contact as well, which has been ongoing throughout, throughout the whole of, of, of the pandemic, which some patients prefer anyway, and, and, I, and I think that's absolutely fine. I think we've done what we can do, um, and I think we may be moving on to another stage now where we will be able to uh, be, be seeing patients in a face-to-face, but dependent on uh, what's acceptable within calculus, really. I was just going to say as well, so I just noticed Non's comment there about the hubs in the home. And I suppose, yes, we need to kind of get some um, patient feedback on those. So we're sending those out to some of our um, patients um, group um, users, service users, um, to get kind of an idea on that. But equally, they don't need um, the internet. They're, they're used like a mobile phone signal. So as long as somebody's got a smart TV... Um, and I suppose the difficulty is if you've got a smart TV, you've usually got internet. But, you know, for so, some people may have smart TVs um, without internet and therefore we, they could use hubs in the home. So, again, that's another maybe way of um, getting information out to people and working with people. Um, I have a question for you, Ruth and uh, Grevin. Uh, excellent presentation. 
Um, essentially, with the fact that as we are moving virtual with most of service, and there are some areas that it doesn't, it does lack service or pain management. Is that something you can co-link with other pain management in different areas to share experience, or do you, are you looking at this type of uh, engagement with other pain management program to be able to work cross site cover? Is it easier going to be in this in this situation? Yeah, I, I think that's going to be an interesting question, isn't it? Because if if, if you're if, if you're providing a virtual pain management program, it doesn't really matter where where your patients are. So I, I suppose if we're all working towards a similar uh, or similar programs, and I think within within North Wales, we all tend to do app based programs that essentially it shouldn't where there's capacity, we should be able to share patients throughout North Wales, but maybe that could be even throughout Wales. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have been linking up with the other uh, services, the other teams in North Wales in relation to kind of managing of, um, you know, the virtual platforms. And um, uh, Central have already started their virtual pay management programme. And I think Bangor is still just in the process of kind of planning theirs. Um, but equally, we've had people um, from South Wales and, and from other areas, physiotherapists that are interested in kind of setting up different virtual programmes. Um, who've, who've kind of sat in on our sessions. So again, virtually, that's easy to do. Um, just to give them an idea of how we run our programme, you know, which is perhaps, you know, not the best. You know, it, it's kind of everybody's going to difference how they set up their individual programmes, aren't they? But it gives them an idea. Yeah, exactly. You're looking at the cost of these, how much you're going to charge these services to others as well, isn't it? <laughs> oh, we never thought of that. Yeah, we hadn't, have we? Yeah, okay. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of money. Yeah, There's, no, no. There is so many questions coming through, and I'm just um, a bit short of time. We are short of time. I mean, we, we, that's to answer them, we, we can answer them in, in, the, um, in the chat box. But we'd also leave our email in the chat box. So if people yes. want to contact us directly, that, that, that's fine as well. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Much. Right. Uh, we're going to have a coffee break now. The time now is. 10.38. Shall we kind of uh, come back five, five after five minutes? So let's say 10, uh, uh, let's say 45, 10.45. Yeah. And we will have our next speaker and then hopefully we will join you back in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.
because it seems to work. Can you hear me? Uh, hi, Bernard. It's um, Ben, one of the organisers. Um, what I'm going to do is just, I'm sharing a slide with just a copy break logo a minute, but if, if you want to get your slide set up, do you want to do that? Yeah, I can have them open. So if I go into um, kind of presentation mode. Yeah. So um, on Zoom, what you'll have to do is click share screen, I think. Uh, it's in a Uh, yeah. This top one. Uh, well, I have to, to quit the meeting short briefly and come back because otherwise you can't record my slides. It's just the preferences from my Mac here. Is that okay? Hello? Hi, hi. yeah. Do you want us to not record your slides? Is that okay? No, 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 no. Only I need to just leave Zoom and come back in. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't take the changes I'm going to do in the system preferences. Okay. No problem at all. No problem. I think you haven't had a nice message that you can't record now, is it? Uh, yeah. Well, I can. I can see your. I can see your screen now. Um, yeah, that's good. I so I probably don't need to do this. Okay, there that's good. Go. I can see my screen. Can you see me? Okay, because I'm just reading, you know, off my main screen now. That's great. Yeah, I can see. Uh, we can see your, see your video and we can see your slides. Okay, that's great. We'll just give it a couple more minutes till uh, everyone's back. I think um, I'll wait till new, new till um, Ranj and Sunil are back. And are you okay to see the rest of my office? You know, <laughs> I don't know how to put a, a, an artificial background in here. So don't worry, it's a lovely office. Good morning, uh, Bernard. Uh, thank you very much for um, presenting in the Wales Pain Society meeting. Before you start, I would like to introduce Dr. Bernard Frank. He's uh, our very esteemed colleague. Um, I remember Bernard, he was trained in the Northeast and I heard of him and then, and I heard that he got a job in the Walton Centre. He's now 11 years. His main interest in neuropathic pain with a special emphasis on, on central brain, trying to get transcranial magnetic stimulation service for post-stroke um, pain. It's a quite exciting topic and it would be interesting to, to invite you for more talk about this in future. He's also have interest in fibromyalgia with research projects looking at small fiber loss. He's also involved in pilot projects support people coming off opioids in the community and are hopeful to get funding for the proper RCT. He's involved in transitional pain MDT for adolescents coming from Alderhey. And welcome to Dr. Bernard Fang. Thank you very much again. Uh, both me and Sunil will be basically taking questions and you might, you might start your talk. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and obviously we have a lot of patients we share with North Wales, you know, in the Wharton Centre and I also have a patient, you know, I took off opioids from Swansea recently. So I think it's an honor to uh, speak to the Welsh Pain Society. What I would like to do today is just uh, to give you a kind of a more clinical orientated uh, presentation of what I am allowed to do and what I have done over the last few years. 
in the Wharton Center uh, to deal with kind of patients on high doses of opioids and how we try to manage them and uh, get them either off opioids or at least reduced, you know, into a safe range of opioids. So um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so uh, I just uh, give you kind of a small back, a quick background about, um, you know, what's happening in the community and why we have to do this uh, as pain doctors then what we can do in the Walton Center, uh, kind of which patients are referred to me. Um, we have a kind of an outpatient opioid reduction service and we have an inpatient opioid reduction service. And then uh, I try to uh, kind of say something briefly about uh, long, short-term and long-term opioid maintenance, what the, what the future holds, and then I'm open to question and I hope we will have 10 minutes at least, you know, to do the questions. So, um, there has been just a publication uh, I got from my PhD student um, about this um, study where they looked at uh, the Prescriber database, um, you know, from the primary care uh, collection, and they had a look, you know, why uh, the opioid prescribing uh, has gone up in the UK, and it was quite a detailed study, uh, much bigger than what has been published in the, in the past, and I just put on my slide here why, um, you know, the study has been done and what they looked for. And um, it seems like, you know, that um, the behavior of uh, general practitioners and, you know, other specialists uh, in hospitals have been the key driver for uh, opioid uh, increases, you know, in the community. So they, they looked at just nearly 2 million uh, new opioid users, which is a huge number uh, from the electronic health records. And they found, you know, that... Um, opioid prescribing has gone up, particularly in uh, kind of weak opioids like codeine, which you can see on the uh, graph later on. But there has been a 30-fold increase in oxycodone and 7-fold increase in trauma prescription. So we always uh, took, you know, the uh, weak opioids into consideration uh, when we looked at uh, how to tackle uh, opioids long term. And I think that's probably uh, quite important to just uh, stop this entry portal, you know, of opioid treatment with uh, kind of weaker opioids before they then switch to strong opioids. So uh, obviously uh, the, resu the results from the study was that uh, we should uh, take care in prescribing of opioids and you should uh, closely monitor, you know, the individual factors for long-term use. And uh, there's certainly a, a large variation in regions and we have uh, three of the highest opioid prescribing CCGs in our neighborhood, hence, you know, my... <laughs> Kind of my, my, my service and why I got involved in uh, this pretty early on. So like I said, there are the kind of graphs and you can see, you know, how um, huge the increase from 2006 to uh, 2014 or so was. And uh, luckily, I think if more uh, up-to-date data, you can see that it has at least come to a halt. And I hope, you know, that uh, by all the uh, kind of initiatives who have been put in place that uh, the number of strong opioid prescribing will come down uh, in the future. So obviously I'm uh, Australian trained and I uh, offer a biopsychosocial model of chronic pain and I think it's important to have a whole team available who can uh, help you out with these patients and I hopefully have some kind of dedicated psychology support you know for this service in the not too distant future. Um, like I said all patients um, are referred from uh, GPs, other specialists, or from my colleagues, you know, uh, to have their opioid medication reviewed. They are uh, sometimes referred, you know, from uh, outside the area, but it's a particular request for our pain management program. But uh, during the initial uh, kind of assessment, we found that there are far too much uh, opioids, which will just put them to sleep, you know, during the program. And they um, are then kind of... Uh, looked at uh, from an opioid cessation side first. And uh, I think the um, increase of um, the detrimental effects of high opioids has uh, kind of been re realized by our spinal surgeons and other new uh, functional surgeons, so they refer them you know, in-house. And we accept currently it's still everybody who is uh, outside the safe range, but uh, depending on the referral load, we might uh, probably hook put this barrier up a bit higher to, I don't know, 200 or 300 uh, milligrams of morphine equivalent. And I, I have a, a, an electronic coding system in the hospital and I code them with F112. So I can ask informatics, you know, how many patients came in 
and hopefully we can use this uh, a bit more um, detailed for audit purposes in the future. But basically, when we see these patients first, we have a chat, you know, and I personally believe, and this is from the uh, Opioid Aware website, that uh, detoxification uh, should be the primary aim because uh, you need to have some time off opioids altogether to reassess these patients because uh, things like opioid-induced hyperalgesia and the kind of chronic changes you get from opioid use will not be disappearing after only a uh, reduction you know, by 50% or something. I think you have to uh, discuss this with the patient and uh, kind of put this as a primary aim. You can always negotiate down and you know, slow this down eventually, but I think that should be um, the, the starting point. And uh, like I said in the last uh, kind of point here, that sometimes you need to do something with buprenorphine and methadone just to give them a bit more time. And after you have stabilized them, uh, take them off opioids altogether and then uh, do a, a new assessment. So the uh, main treatment uh, happens on outpatient basis. So I will see them for 45 minutes to an hour and plan to see them actually soon with my, one of my prescriber nurses so that we, she can take over the prescribing if we have to straight away rather than they have to wait until she can see them as a new appointment. Otherwise, she wouldn't be allowed uh, to do the prescribing. And then uh, we basically review uh, the effectiveness and the side effects of the opioids. We uh, have you know, certain criteria, and if they have significant side effects from uh, kind of uh, opioids, then we decide you know, on complete cessation, like I said before. And uh, we try then uh, to taper them by 10% per week uh, after we have calculated the morphine equivalent dose. Oh, sorry. Um, so just for this calculation you know, of the um, medial dose, this is a table. Uh, hopefully, this uh, kind of presentation will be available to you, so feel free to use it. Uh, and how we uh, basically would start ta uh, tapering kind of the fentanyl uh, patches. Um, sorry. And um, then I sent this out you know, uh, to the patient and sent it out to the GP so that they have an idea how to prescribe you know, the uh, taper regimen. And it has been uh, received quite well. But I have to say, with my attempt you know, and changes for fentanyl patches on our area prescribing committee, I don't see that many patients on high doses of fentanyl anymore, I think, which is a good uh, development you know, from uh, the, the changes you know, in the prescribing policies. Um, so I have another table here for morphine. It's just an example. I have uh, kind of tables we have generated with the nurses uh, for most of uh, the opioids who come through our door and, you know, so that the patients have a clear idea they can tick boxes and how uh, the prescribing should uh, go down uh, with this 10%, you know, per week. I put in this table that, uh, you know, at 60 milligrams twice a day, you can actually try a cross taper to tapentadol, which is the main reason why I use uh, tapentadol because it seems to uh, be less potent on the opioid receptor and you can taper them down quicker. We have this, uh, another um, kind of table uh, where we do this cross taper and uh, you can either you know, try to take them down by 10 milligrams per week or I try to start off with, with 10 milligrams twice a day per week and then increase the tapentadol kind of uh, much slower because I hope that most of the patients will get this secondary effect and then you can stabilize them on a much lower um, opioid co corresponding dose. And the idea behind this is, again, that you give the system time uh, to basically calm down and then, uh, you know, three months, six months down the line, you can then try to get them off the pentadol. And if it doesn't really work um, much better than the other opioids, patients are quite willing and it's quite easy then to uh, kind of get them off opioids altogether. So obviously, if this uh, doesn't work on an outpatient basis, um, then um, there are some uh, other things we can offer them. Um, you know, we try to see them every four to eight weeks by telephone now because of the COVID pandemic. But, uh, you know, because we take over a lot of the prescribing, in particular for tapentadol uh, and methadone or something like this. So we have to issue scripts on, on a regular basis anyway. And that uh, means that we have to see them, you know, four to eight weekly uh, due to the uh, CD status of these drugs. Um, so I, I do sometimes, you know, serial rotations down. So if they come in with a high dose of oxycodone, for example, it's actually quite a good way 
to, to rotate them to morphine and then drop 30% at the same time because I think the 1 to 2 rotation is not really adequate and it's more 1 to 1.5. So you give them actually a bit better pain relief, which makes um, the patients your friend. And then you can uh, try to reduce uh, the dose you know, by 30% and then start tapering uh, the uh, morphine again by 10% or 10 milligrams twice a day per week. And uh, again, the drop per week will then be a bit less than uh, with more potent opioids like oxycodone for them. And sometimes you can then rotate them back to oxycodone or try to rotate them to um, kind of hydromorphone. But like I said, we do a lot of rotation to uh, tapentadol because we then get them off the tapentadol afterwards. In severe cases, and I have done this uh, more with my uh, kind of transdermal fentanyl patients, uh, they the drop is quite significant and they have got a lot of this opioid induced hyperalgesia. So they respond quite well if you give them a bit of oral ketamine just to give them some alternative pain relief. And that normally works well to uh, keep them on track uh, with uh, the tapering of the fentanyl patches. But because I don't see that many fentanyl patches anymore, I think that uh, has, um, has reduced in terms of how often we use this. Clonidine, uh, you know, everybody knows from ITU sedation and is a good um, IFRA receptor antagonist, you know, which calms down the withdrawal symptoms. So that can be titrated uh, to up to 300 micrograms to, to per day just to reduce the sweating and the kind of symptom, symptoms from opioid withdrawal. Again, that can be done uh, on an outpatient basis uh, quite easily. Again, there's another uh, equivalence table uh, here where you can work out uh, how to do this um, rotation. And I have, you know, uh, kind of heretically just set, uh, put tapentadol in the weak opioid part here because I think, you know, up to 100 or 150 milligrams even, tapentadol would be more acting like a, a weak opioid. And that's the reason why you can get them uh, off it uh, quite easily afterwards. Still, the oxycodone conversion is the, the traditional one, but I don't think, um, you know, this is really clinically uh, the case. Um, and I think if you do this calculations, just drop uh, 25 to 30% uh, off the new opioid anyhow, and then you're making progress to get uh, patients, you know, down and off opioids uh, eventually. So uh, just a quick slide about ketamine, you know, it has got uh, complete different properties than opioids. So it's a non-opioid analgesic. And um, I think because of the NMD receptor antagonism, which might be uh, heavily involved in this um, central wind-ups or tolerance development in opioids, it has actually some logical and uh, some logic behind, you know, why you should use it in this kind of patients. Again, I don't use more than uh, three months of it uh, at any time and then uh, try to uh, stop it again. And um, I don't go higher than 200 milligrams per day. This is the cutoff where you shouldn't get really problems with liver uh, issues and ketamine cystitis and uh, things like this. Obviously, if they get good uh, pain relief from uh, the ketamine, you know, they see it as a motivational support and they normally believe you that you know what you're doing and then uh, they, they develop some trust and you know, follow your guidance to get them further down the way of coming off opioids. A quick word about tapentadol. Um, again, it's uh, probably one-fifth of the potency of morphine uh, just from clinical experience and what you see in terms of withdrawal when you get the, the dose wrong, uh, converting them. Uh, like I said, there is this up, uh, uptake of uh, reuptake of noradrenaline, which might you know be opioid sparing. Uh, I think it's quite a safe opioid uh, for GPs to use because uh, they can't go higher than 500 milligrams of um, tapentadol twice a day, which is a ceiling dose which doesn't exist for other opioids, and it should still be below the 60 milligram of morphine equivalent, 100 milligram of morphine equivalent maximum dose per day. I have not been successful doing it at a higher dose of 60 because uh, patients go into significant withdrawal uh, as um, you know, when you do this and then they hate you. So I always taper the uh, morphine down to 60 milligrams twice a day and then we do a cross taper um, kind of with the tapentadol. And like I said, we have done an audit on the first 250 patients or so and uh, they found that a superior opioid that certainly get less uh, drowsiness and a lot, lot of less constipation and like I said, if this works well, they normally continue on tapentadol, but if not, then it's quite easy by the GP or the patient to really stop this uh, without having coming having to come back to hospital again. So uh, again, most of the patients who didn't get much benefit were then off opioids um, altogether, you know, after a year when we uh, followed this uh, up uh, with the GP records. Um, 
Like I said, I'm, I'm trained in Australia and they used a lot of um, methadone um, in the setting, you know, particular for pump patients uh, when they go into acute withdrawal. So I had a bit of experience with it and I still find it uh, quite a useful uh, kind of opioids if you uh, take away all these connotations with drug addiction and I use tablets so they uh, don't need to take any liquids. And I think that makes it more like a painkiller than uh, the kind of um, daily pickups in uh, the community. And I have been quite successful in rotating people from low-dose methadone to tapentadol quite easily and backwards, and that is sometimes an option you know, uh, to maintain them long-term. Um, and in particular, if you have patients who had a good uh, response to ketamine, you can combine this NMDA receptor antagonism uh, in one molecule and then use uh, methadone uh, uh, as an opioid and obviously as an uh, NMDA receptor antagonist. So it's quite well absorbed. You need to be a bit patient. And I think the problem with methadone is that uh, people use it too uh, quickly. And uh, you need to really be patient. Start with five milligrams three times a day and increase it by five milligrams per week. And then you don't normally don't see really um, kind of toxicity. And I don't go higher than a maximum of 40 in quite uh, large patients. Uh, but I think the average dose is around 30 milligrams per day. And uh, it's good in diabetics, you know, they, there's no problems with accommodation and renal failure. And um, sometimes, you know, they are uh, quite well controlled on um, methadone for some time. It comes in tablets. And um, uh, I do actually rotations or have done in the past. I don't do this that often uh, where patients are on uh, less than 200 milligrams of morphine equivalent a day. I do it on an outpatient basis and you can use a one to 10 ratio uh, to not trigger too many uh, withdrawal symptoms, but anything higher, you don't know where to start. And I think it's safer uh, if you do this uh, as an inpatient and then you can give them uh, a bit of uh, pain relief, you know, with oral ketamine until you, uh, the dose is right. And that can usually be done in between five and seven days, I would say. And uh, the 40 milligrams is when you speak to drug and alcohol doctors, you know, they can normally get people off uh, methadone by doing a lingual buprenorphine taper, and again, that's a good starting point, you know, um, not to exceed this so that you can you get your patients off, off methadone uh, any time, you know, you want to do it. In Canada and in, in, in Australia as well, they used to have much higher doses of, of methadone, and like I said, in the literature, they used to go up to 160 milligrams per day, which is, uh, I think, uh, difficult to monitor because you have to do regular ECGs, and that's where you get really into the problems with uh, QTC uh, elongation and uh, you need to be really careful and that's where a lot of the um, kind of accidents or uh, kind of severe side effects with uh, methadone happen but I have never seen a problem at um, kind of the 30 milligrams I use and a lot of patients you know uh, find this a superior opioid and it seems to work you know for quite a prolonged time uh, before you have to rotate them again. I think I said a bit of this already uh, in, at the start. Um, and like I said, we have to prescribe uh, a bit more uh, via FP10s, which gets sent out to the patient because patients couldn't come to our hospital pharmacy anymore. And I see a lot of tertiary referrals who are from quite a distance away. So, uh, but we have agreed that we can't manage more than 30 patients at any one time. So at the moment, we will only offer this uh, uh, when we are able to either rotate methadone off to something like tapentadol the GP can then prescribe or get patients of it altogether or get them discharged. Because it's uh, logistically uh, quite challenging, you know, to uh, prescribe from a tertiary pain clinic for a lot of patients. Uh, so my preferred opioid nowadays is actually high-dose sublingual buprenorphine, and I have done a workshop in uh, Boston with uh, Mark Sullivan, who uses a lot in, in Seattle, and it seems to be uh, really um, working well. And I, I have done uh, 27 patients now in the Wharton Center uh, when I, as admission, and uh, you can normally stabilize them in three days or so on the right dose, and then um, taper them on an outpatient basis off opioids altogether, or maintain them if they have superior pain relief and then try again, you know, after some time to get them off um, this opioid altogether. So it comes in um, kind of different sizes. We use uh, mainly two milligrams and eight milligram tablets. 
I think the ceiling effect for pain relief is not really correct anymore. And you can normally get uh, kind of more pain relief if, if you go higher on the dose. And I think uh, I have never used more than 16 milligrams really. So I don't know uh, if this uh, stops afterwards, but uh, it seems to uh, you know generate quite significant pain relief as well if you just uh, put them on this uh, from a different opioid. They are much safer, so you hardly get uh, respiratory depression of the buprenorphine. Um, and it uh, can be staged down to a patch, you know, if you want to uh, do the weaning um, more slowly. And um, I still use it on an outpatient basis, uh, you know, up to 100 milligrams of morphine equivalent, but anything above this I would usually admit and do it uh, as an inpatient. And I have seen, you know, from doing this a lot, that uh, patients, particularly with visceral pain, find this uh, a better opioid if you go to the higher dosages of two milligrams twice a day or so than other opioids because of the activity on kappa receptors and uh, delta receptors, you know, which uh, makes it a superior opioid to uh, the other opioids we normally use. Uh, but my aim is still, you know, when I do this on an inpatient basis to get them off it all together and then uh, reassess the situation. So um, I admit patients for other reasons as well, but uh, I have done 17 inpatient treatments since October, November 2015. Uh, like I said, I have started off with some uh, ketamine infusions in the beginning, and I still have got this protocol uh, for opioid detoxification in the Watton Center, but have not used it in the last two years or so. Um, but uh, that's available you know, if you want uh, to see how uh, you can titrate patients on IV ketamine if you want to take them off opioids. Um, so I have to say that um, all patients got discharged from the pain clinic altogether uh, on less than 100 milligrams of morphine equivalent or tapentadol, uh, and quite a few um, were actually off opioids altogether. And uh, uh, the, the admission is often necessary, you know, if to, to do this with GPs, you don't know out of your area then um, it's, it's difficult to do when they come for pain management referrals. So I have done at least 10 or so who were referred to our pain management course and they got uh, opioid free before they started uh, the pain management uh, program. So, but uh, the general rule is that I offer this to patients who don't progress as an outpatient basis because you don't want patients in a low grade of withdrawal for a long time. So I think it's not very nice to patients to carry on on an outpatient basis uh, forever. So we normally offer them uh, an inpatient detox if they struggle you know, to carry on the uh, slow taper on an outpatient basis. We normally screen them for some psychological issues and uh, some of my psychologists from the PMP have been very helpful to assess them before I admit them because you know, if they have got a lot of me mental health problems, they can become quite unstable from mental health point of view if you take them off opioids and that uh, I have experienced this uh, once or twice uh, in person. So I think it's always good to have a clear assessment prior to the admission. And then uh, we will take them off opioids um, and uh, put them on buprenorphine and then the taper will happen at home. Again, we try to get them off it uh, in three months or so. And um, I have tried them on other opioids again, you know, when I have reassessed them and we do a proper opioid trial, see that they get significant benefit from opioids and improvement in function. And I think then uh, you can just manage them on low doses of opioids uh, long term. So just a practical way how we do this, uh, they get admitted on a Sunday night uh, and we stop all opioids uh, with the evening dose so that they're in a bit of withdrawal in the morning uh, as the uh, opioids are washed out uh, overnight. And then we start them on two milligrams of supreme buprenorphine twice a day, and they can have another two milligrams every six hours, but uh, I try not to go higher than eight milligrams or so on the first day. Um, but uh, we have had one patient who needed 10 milligrams who came in on very high doses uh, of opioids before. Then we give them clonidine, uh, PRN, so if the buprenorphine really doesn't control the withdrawal, then they can have some clonidine and that makes them a bit sedated so they can sleep better and uh, they are calmer on the ward uh, with the clonidine. And for pain relief, you know, they can have some oral ketamine up to 50 milligrams PRN uh, six hourly and we change this to regular for the uh, time in hospital if they need more than three doses over 24 hours. 
But I always aim to uh, try to discontinue the ketamine on discharge, but uh, admittedly, I have to uh, give it sometimes, you know, for months or so later on our patients to make them progressing with uh, the uh, buprenorphine taper. And uh, again, the patients are then discharged on a Friday afternoon usually, and uh, they have a four weeks supply from us. And when, uh, if the GP refuses to prescribe the buprenorphine, which is only licensed for addiction medicine and not for pain at the moment, which uh, makes it a bit tricky, then we supply the remaining months or two uh, via FP10 scripts or hospital scripts uh, from the Walton Center. So again, I have got tables at different uh, discharge dose, dosing. So uh, this is the highest one I have ever used. So if they are discharged on 10 milligrams per day, I keep them stable, you know, for two weeks. And then we start tapering, um, you know, uh, by two milligrams to start off with, and then uh, by 0.4 milligrams per week. And uh, that's just, you know, guidance of the way how you have to prescribe it. And so everybody can uh, do this from our clinic. And the patients, you know, uh, can then tick the weeks and hopefully get off it uh, in 24 weeks, which is still a long time. Hence, you know, the idea to discharge them on the lowest dose from hospital as possible, because it can take a, a while, you know, to do so on an outpatient basis if they are discharged on 10 milligrams. So, like I said, this is just an audit we just completed um, last week, and um, the mean age you know, was 52, so they, they are quite uh, long-lasting uh, opioid-treated patients. They were all in ongoing severe pain, so you can always use this argument that uh, the pain might get much better by coming off opioids, which is the case. There are more women than uh, men, uh, quite a mixture of pain conditions, you know, reflecting what I see in my clinic. Uh, so primary chronic pain would be mainly fibromyalgia patients. The average dose was, you know, more than 450 milligrams, but quite a large range. This was crude because I had one guy who was on high dose lamotrigine, and he responded quite well actually to the open off and detox just um, to calm down the craving. And I got him off the lamotrigine and off the uh, buprenorphin. Uh, but he was the outlier in this uh, collection of patients. And like I said, the average buprenorphin dose is around 5.1 5 milligrams. Um, and uh, like I said, the time in hospital can be extended sometimes, but this is mainly down to social problems to get them home in time. Um, but, uh, you know, it can be quite quick. So two to 12 days is uh, my experience. And uh, like I said, we had 12 patients who are off opioids altogether and uh, 15 are in a safe range, but they are back on some other opioids, which I always um, try to discuss again, you know, during the annual reviews and see if I can uh, get them either off it or onto um, a better regimen in the future. But I'm planning to do a more pro uh, protocol-driven and a prospective audit, as I think this will be the way how I'm treating the inpatients now long-term and see if we can identify patients who respond very well and uh, hopefully uh, make this a more um, straightforward uh, approach to get people off opioids. Still, you know, what from the initial data when I started this talk is, you know, that we need to work uh, with our GPs and learn from other countries to prevent the UK uh, to get into this uh, pandemic state like the uh, US. And hopefully, you know, with new guidelines, uh, opioids will not be used that commonly by GPs anymore without input from pain clinics. But that's my um, re main reason why I work with the community, because, you know, by having some light at the end of the tunnel for this inpatient and opioid detoxes in pain clinics, you need to stop GPs, you know, producing more patients with this problem in the future. And uh, then hopefully we will tackle it and there might not be any patients on inappropriate opioids uh, in the future in the UK. So in summary, uh, obviously there are still a considerable number of patients on too high dose of opioids, but on the bright side, I have to say the number from just my personal impression has got um, lower and uh, you know you we have had the chance here to learn from the americans and i think we have done this and hopefully we can prevent this epidemic um i think from my experience we, we usually manage in the majority of patients except the ones who just uh, don't come back for follow-ups but there are only a few to get patients into a safer range or off opioids altogether so it's a quite rewarding uh, job to do. 
Um, and I hope you know that we can uh, do an inpatient stay much shorter uh, in the future and uh, get you know uh, most of our wards uh, trained to do it because we had to change our wards from COVID, which was a bit of a, a tricky experience. And uh, the, the kind of the benefit is that uh, you know if you speak to patients afterwards, they are so thankful that they are more clear-headed. You know their pain is actually surprisingly much better coming off opioids. And uh, my intention in the community is that we need to find some form of motivational support intervention which we can offer them in the community because um, it takes a lot of time, you know, from nurses and a lot of talking to uh, patients. So uh, I think if this needs to be done more in the community, there need to be um, training and uh, a better way of uh, kind of keeping patients uh, progressing with the uh, opioid reduction. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and I'm open uh, for questions. Thank you very much, Bernard. That was excellent talk. And in fact, um, you're sharing your experience from Australia, where you did your fellowship in South Shore. I can, I can imagine there is a lot of also um, built up to that. There's quite a few interested, uh, interesting questions in the chat, um, and I'll start with uh, the first one. Um, um, it's a, uh, do you get GP agreement uh, to the opioid reduction plan prior to booking admission? Just regarding the agreement providing prescriptions of asking uh, sublingual buprenorphine, ketamine, lidocaine, which I imagine most are way to do. Uh, I think I, I tried to do this in the, in the past and there are some GPs locally, you know, normally who agree. So I... I haven't done the prescribing for all of the patients, but the problem is, you know, that it's not licensed for pain. So uh, the pharmacist and the GP surgeries can usually say, you know, they are not obliged to take it over. I have uh, put an application into our area prescribing committee to get Bupinov and kind of uh, agreed, you know, to be used by GPs under uh, the guidance of a pain clinic, you know, so that they can prescribe it. But uh, to be honest, you know, that's a lot of, and admin work to do and um, these patients you know they are only on our prescriptions for uh, two three months so I think they are the more easy one to take over the prescribing because you know they will come off book and off and all together um, and then you stop the prescription so uh, it needs to be taken into account when you plan the service and uh, I think we try to um, you know get a pathway together and how much uh, nursing contacts we will need in the future to do look after these patients. But like I said, it's usually uh, three scripts, you know, maximum, and then they're off the uh, book and off and all together. There is another question for you, uh, Bernard. Um, what sort of patients is ideal for opioid reduction regime? I imagine the conversation will be tricky to meet with the resistance. I think, you know, the um, patients who come to me, they usually are referred for this purpose. So uh, we have obviously the initial discussion you know, and explain to them why it's uh, important and why, what are the benefits, you know, coming uh, off opioids. And I have to say, because I have done this now for five years and I have, um, you know, seen a lot of benefit from it, I, I think I come across, you know, to the patient that I know what I'm doing and that they believe me and, and trust. And I think we all sing from the same hymn sheet. But uh, I think, you know, the ones who are on really high dosages who are unsafe, you know, there are a lot of patients with uh, psychological or kind of psychiatric comorbidities. Again, uh, they are tricky, but I think they benefit quite a lot coming down on the opioids uh, to be just in a, in a safer dose range. And uh, I think, you know, people who have got um, biological changes from the opioids, like opioid-induced hyperalgesia, endocrine disturbances and whatever, they will really realize the benefit coming off it. So there is no good answer, but I think, you know, uh, everybody who is on more than 200 milligrams of morphine equivalent really should reduce, and uh, they are the one I, I would accept, you know, as a referral. Um, um, there is actually quite a lot of questions. Um, I'm just picking up a question from uh, Dr. Ebler. Is What's your experience uh, as where these high opioid scripts are originating from. Uh, sometimes he say we are shocked to see excessive fentanyl patch that came in uh, when patient referred from a GP. Yeah, I think, you know, the fentanyl patches are coming mainly from primary care because, you know, there has been an army of uh, reps in, you know, 10, 15 years ago who sold fentanyl as a, a, a magic 
kind of painkiller for a lot of arthritic, arthritic patients and rheumatoids. And I think that's why there's quite a lot of fentanyl patches out there. But uh, again, I have put a, a safety limit on our area prescribing committee formulary. And uh, so they are not allowed to use more than 25 micrograms of fentanyl without some pain clinic involvement. And I have to say that has reduced a lot of the issues and you can basically encourage GPs to come down on the fentanyl this way. But um, I think a lot of the overprescribing comes not from pain clinics, so it comes from other sources. So we basically sort out other people's problem. But uh, you know, I got a lot of tertiary referrals and there have been some obscure kind of opioid management regimens from other pain clinics as well. But I think we are most of the time not really uh, the high opioid prescriber uh, in this patient population. Um, we've got a couple of more minutes, um, and I was thinking to ask you, uh, Bernard, um, is there any formal assessment uh, uh, methods to assess someone with opioid-induced hyperalgesia? Do we have like a questionnaire or um, a type of assessment method? I don't use one. There might be some out there in the literature, but I think they usually present like fibromyalgia patients, uh, and it's, you know, uh, the, the question, you know, if it's, if it's really fibromyalgia or are the opioids the culprit? So that's uh, the rewarding part, getting them off op opioids to reassess them. But like I said, they're usually quite uh, agitated, you know, when you touch them and, you know, they, they are quite um, kind of sensitive, you know, to uh, any form of uh, sensory input. So uh, I think it's more, you know, a, a clinical experience, you know, how you identify them. And it's not that common, you know, um, as you think, I see it mainly in, in, in the high dose fentanyl patients, which have reduced, you know, uh, recently. So I think the ones where you uh, get all the signs, you know, and where it gets better as well, you know, when you taper down the opioids are the one on high dose fentanyl patches. Great, thank you. And do you do any uh, checks for, uh, like, do you do any blood tests for, to check for endocrine dysfunctions during reduction program? Um, not really, because I think it's, Obviously a, a problem, um, but, you know, I spoke to endocrinologists about this beforehand and, um, you know, it might not be reversible um, and you have to do a, a challenging test. So it's not kind of sorted out by just doing a random testosterone level or something like this. I think, you know, you have to test the uh, adrenal axis or the uh, androgenic axis, you know, by giving them stimulating hormones to produce more sex hormones. And that's not the easily done. Uh, ho yeah, hopefully, you know, they will get better and the testosterone levels will increase again. But um, if there is an issue in terms of clinical problems like libido loss and, you know, they feel really unwell on loss, uh, low sex hormones, then it might be worthwhile to send them to an endocrinologist to just get them replacement therapy. But, uh, you know, um, I'm not um, kind of measuring this kind of routinely. <laughs> Um, thank you again. We've got one more minute and I'm asking these questions. What I remind our um, colleagues and delegates who are listening is obviously if you have more questions, I'm quite happy to forward them to Bernard and uh, he will definitely reply back to you. Um, I've got uh, a question uh, from uh, uh, Michael Johns. Um, it's, it's saying thank you for your great talk. Does the panel feel long-term opioid example buprenorphine? five to 30 micrograms per hour included, have a role for chronic non-cancer pain and the particular for osteoarthritis? I, I use buprenorphine patches uh, sometimes. I do it, you know, it's an easy way to test if patients are opioid responsive, you know, if they are opioid naive. Uh, I said, I don't believe in codeine because, you know, 15% don't respond to it because they can't convert it into morphine. So I think buprenorphine is better in this regard. It's a very low dose, you know, if you compare this to the two milligram subringual dose, you know, if you're on a 20 microgram patch, you know, that's uh, 20 milligrams per week. So, uh, you know, if you divide this by seven, it's, uh, you know, around uh, two and a half milligrams per day. So I think that's where the scope is by using high dose sublingual buprenorphine compared to what you can get, you know, with the patches. Um, and I don't go higher really than 20 or 30 micrograms on these patches. But the problem is that lots of patients don't tolerate it, you know, because of skin rushes or, you know, the patches are not uh, delivering, you know, uh, uh, the, the kind of opioids as well as the sublingual route. But uh, yeah, I think they are certainly safer and much better than fentanyl patches. So they should have uh, their, their stay, you know, by uh, treating people with uh, 
clear kind of nociceptive pain in arthritis because, like I said, they are usually quite compliant and you can control the dose which is delivered per day much better than giving them Oromorph or, you know, opioid tablets, which they can take in a higher dose than prescribed. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, I don't think so, Sunil. Do you have any questions yeah. for... Um, yeah, I know. That's been excellent uh, talk. Uh, thank you very much, Bernard. We'll be in touch with you. Um, I don't know if you're going to stay until the end of the meeting, so if you have any questions, that's going to be posted in the chat box. It will be available for him to see. We'll be moving to our next speaker. Um, uh, is um, Basically, it is about uh, the... The training, the pain, pain medicine and training innovation in Wales. Um, and I've got Dr. Katie uh, Wainwright and Dr. Sonia Pierce. Just to uh, introduce um, Dr. Um, Katie Wainwright, she's an aesthetic specialty trainee who's enjoy a challenge and wanted to create something innovative and exciting to complement uh, what training has already done. And speaking uh, about Dr. Sonia Pierce, she's one of our um, colleagues here in North Wales. She um, works in Abergale Hospital. She's uh, the Royal College and East, uh, <coughs> um, Royal College and Eastis Regional Advisor, and also she's a passionate about multidisciplinary pain management and ensuring excellence in pain medicine. Thank you very much for both of you. Um, and um, I would ask Ben if he could um, put you forward for your talk to start. Uh, great. Hi, it's um, Sonia. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you very well. Great. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try and share my screen, so hopefully we'll get the technology to work. Yeah. Uh, bear with me a second. Great. Can you see that, everybody? Yes, we can. Yes, yeah. we can. Well, great. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to start off. So, uh, so thanks. I'm, I'm Sonia Pierce, and I, I'm a consultant in North Wales, as you've said. Um, I'm here today, I guess, primarily in my capacity as uh, the regional advisor in pain medicine um, for the Royal College of Anaesthetists. Um, and my plan for the first five, ten minutes or so is to summarise some of the work of the faculty. But the bulk of this session um, will be to highlight one of the exciting innovations in pain medicine um, we've developed here in Wales. Um, so to start off with, really, I want to give a massive thanks to Dr. Kate Wainwright, who's going to be taking over the second half of this talk. Thank you, Kate. And also to Dr. Richard Wassell, who I think is on the call, um, who both worked exceptionally hard to bring this project to fruition. So thank you. Um, Okay, so the Faculty of Pain Medicine um, is a faculty of the Royal College of Anaesthetists um, with responsibility and authority with regards to patients and those working um, and training in the field of pain medicine. So through its guidance um, and pain medicine training, it promotes the highest standards of practice for patients. Um, and the faculty team have worked really hard during the pandemic, um, despite all of the challenges that, that faced everybody. Um, so an example of the work done uh, by the faculty is the production of this document, which I know Ruth mentioned in her session earlier, um, it's the core standards in pain management for the UK. So this is a collaborative multidisciplinary publication, um, which provides a reference source for the planning and delivery of pain management services in the UK. Um, so this version was first published in 2015. So it's a few years, um, a few years ago now. Um, it's currently been revised for the second edition, and it's hopefully to be released soon. I know the work has been ongoing throughout the pandemic, um, which we've been involved in in Wales as well. So hopefully not too much longer. Um, sorry, move the screen along. There you go. Um, so the, the faculty have produced um, various. Uh, support and um, support networks um, to provide support to the pain community during the pandemic and um, recognizing that as pain specialists we really must strive and adapt to, to deliver safe effective pain management in a, what is a difficult and changing environment um, so for example most recently together with the british pain society the faculty have produced an update um, to those waiting to access pain service which which i know is a, a massive problem um, across the uk certainly here in Wales, um, but there's also a host of other material which is, is, is free to access. The faculty obviously provides training and guidance um, for pain within the anaesthetic medical curriculum um, and to training programmes um, around the UK providing higher and advanced training for doctors in pain medicine. 
this work has obviously had its challenges, not least because they've had to adapt to deliver exams uh, remotely, um, which I know some people on this call have had success with recently, so congratulations. Um, so for anaesthetists who want to specialise in pain medicine, this is going to be a challenge. Um, and that brings us on to the next section of the talk, really. Um, we almost we need we need to be able to train doctors in pain medicine um, who are interested in pain medicine, but we also need to train doctors who are not necessarily particularly interested in pain but have to complete compulsory units of training in order to become a consultant in anaesthetics or ITU. Um, and this has proved a challenge. But I strongly believe we also need to, to, to train all clinicians, not, not just doctors, so all, all members of, um, of healthcare who are involved with the management of persistent pain. Um, it's, it's a challenge worldwide. Um, and disruption of services meant it's been really difficult to provide traditional face-to-face -face teaching opportunities that, that we're used to. So we wanted to, de to develop some form of um, training that can be delivered remotely. Um, and yes, there are various resources already, um, presentations that can be accessed for free, but we wanted to, to think slightly differently and how can we make it a little bit more um, engaging and, um, and exciting for trainees. So if it's okay, I'm going to hand over to you, Kate, for this section, um, who's going to tell you a little bit more, thanks, a bit more about the challenges, ideas and developments um, amongst we've had. So I think I'll, if I stop my screen share, hopefully you'll be able to take over, Kate. Thank you very much. Yeah, got it. Did you, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yep. Um, so thank you everybody for some fantastic talks so far this morning, some really interesting stuff coming on here. Um, my name's Kate. Uh, I'm an anaesthetic trainee in Mills. Um, and uh, I'm here to give you a bit of a flavour for some really exciting stuff we've been doing in pain training over the last few months. Um, due to COVID, uh, we've been faced with a loss of pain, opp pain training opportunities. Uh, lots of clinics have been down and staff have been redeployed. So we wanted to create something that replicated those training opportunities as far as possible. And because we wanted to do something different, we needed to be a bit unconventional. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you my age now. So uh, I, was a, I was a child of the 80s. And when I was a kid, there were these books and you could turn to the page to progress the adventure and choose the story however you wanted. And we thought, wouldn't it be really great if we could do something like this, but for training? Um, and we had a go with the sort of basic software packages you would have on your home laptop um, and it turns out that you can do something like that on PowerPoint uh, but it ends up being a huge unwieldy file that's completely useless because the only place it can live is on a hard drive at home and like a lot of problems if you look long enough on the internet you will find a solution and um, Google came up trumps and that's uh, where we came up with Twine. Now uh, Twine is an open source tool for telling interactive non-linear stories. Uh, it's available free to download at that uh, web address at the bottom there. Um, and, and Twine's pretty basic. Uh, it's for text-based stories. It's, it's developed by gamers. Uh, it's designed for text-based games. Um, but you can add to it. You can add to it with libraries like directories of uh, internet code and JavaScript. And we went for one called Sugarcube um, because it, it handles media and media playback functions. And you can turn your basic Twine text file into a multimedia extravaganza. And, and you can get as involved in this as you want, really, because uh, it, 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 the sky's the limit. And we went from a pretty abstract idea to this, uh, which looks a bit like a headache on a page, but it's our storyboard for a branching choose your own adventure clinical encounter. Each of these individual squares on the page is, uh, is a passage in the module. And as you can see, there are lots of branches here that represent the narrative diverging at key decision points. And 
Right back in June, we started with this, which is a single passage open in twine. You add text, you make a link just by putting square brackets. It's really simple. I had absolutely no code experience. None of us did. Um, but as I said, the sky's the limit. And you can absolutely guarantee that if you want to do something, uh, somebody on the Internet has already done it and they've already shared the code. And so now we're writing things like this, uh, which is uh, a small section of code for a timer that I'll show you a bit later. Um, and because it's all written in HTML code, the language of the internet, it can be as basic or as complex as you want. And the file size still stays tiny. It's also compatible with the majority of the devices. So it's just as accessible on the phone in your pocket as it is on the computer you have in front of you now. And then from this, abstract looking bit of uh, text, uh, you can publish it to this, which is just a simple page with a link and you click the link and you start the module and you get a finished product that looks like this, um, which is a much more familiar setup for learning materials. And the beauty is it literally is choose your own adventure. You can interact with the storyline in a high fidelity way and meet all the learning objectives as you go along. The, the story uses variables entered by the learner and interacts with them throughout the narrative. Here's that, here's that time up in the top corner there that uh, you saw the JavaScript for before. Uh, there, there's the facility to do timed MCQs. Uh, they're marked immediately and the learner can get immediate feedback on their answers. We have patient narratives. We have audio recordings of patient encounters, clinical meetings, MDTs, group sessions, all performed by actors. And at appropriate stages, the learner is prompted to think about the key points they've uh, sort of seen in the history so far and consider discussing the case with the trainer. Depending on how the narrative plays out, the learner might get personalised emails or letters or uh, access to investigations that are pertinent to the case. They might get a text message uh, or be signposted to specific external guidelines or resources. Um, we've been really careful to make sure that regardless of how the storyline plays out, uh, learners get exposed to the same resources along the way and still meet the learning objectives. Actually, I think uh, the greatest strength of, of this platform is being able to access the data and see the guidelines and listen to the audio recordings and then act on that information to make clinical decisions, which influence the outcome of this case, but have no strings attached because you can just start again from the beginning. And at the end, the learner gets a generated certificate for their own records, demonstrating how long they've spent on the module. So anyway, we've we've developed this great thing and it turns out that NHS firewalls really don't like random HTML files being emailed in and nobody could open it anywhere. Um, so uh, that was another challenge to overcome. And that's why we ended up with this, which is uh, our, our new website. Now, if all that twine javascripty stuff at the beginning made you flinch a bit i can honestly say that the website development is completely drag and drop and uh putting this site together took less time than it took to build this talk today um it's really simple there are various headings up there that you can access the different areas of the website the modules are freely available on here um, they are accessible with by any device that has internet capabilities. You don't need any specific downloads or software. Um, within the site, we thought it would be really helpful to have a password protected trainers area. Um, and within here, we've got some trainer guides so that if a, if a trainee, if a learner uh, approached a trainer and said, I've, I've done this case online, I'd really like to do a case based discussion or um, I'd like to talk through the key points with you. The trainer doesn't need to have done the module, which might take an hour or two. They can just download the trainer guide, have the, the key points of the case and then um, know the learning outcomes from that material. And. Really importantly, 
we wanted to know that what we'd created was doing what we intended to do. Um, so we set up an automatic audit function on the website, um, which was launched 12 weeks ago. And um, so far we've had the first module, which is the pilot module and slightly shorter. We've had the access 69 times. Uh, modules two and three, which are slightly longer, have been accessed 124 times and 167 times respectively. The website itself is getting multiple hundreds of hits per week, and that's building week on week. So we're seeing more footfall as the word is spreading. Um, we haven't put any compulsory feedback aspect into the modules because we wanted to make this as approachable as possible. But there is the option at the end to choose to leave feedback if you wish. Um, and the free comments have been incredibly encouraging. Um, it's been wholly positive feedback. Everybody really loves what we're offering. Um, and we found that this has gone beyond anaesthetic trainees and the platform is being used by physiotherapists and nurse specialists and psychologists, uh, all with a pain background as well. So it, it's, it's clearly very approachable. And the beauty of it is people can access it how they wish. If they want to access guidelines uh, as they become available, they can. Otherwise, they can skip on. They can just follow the narrative. And I think absolutely crucially from this, um, everybody who's done something, has done this, has said they've learned something. And I think that's really, really important. And everybody wants to do more and we are happy to provide. So we're going to carry on creating modules for now. Uh, for us, that's a really big win. Um, I've only given you a really brief summary of what we've been doing. Uh, if you take one thing from this talk, then take this web address or take the QR code and go and have a look. Uh, we think what we're doing is really, really exciting and has an absolutely huge amount of potential. So go and have a look and go and have a go. Um, and if you want, there's a contact form on the website or there's a feedback form and, and tell us what you think. We really, really love to hear from you. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your time today. And uh, if anyone has any questions, Sonia and I would be happy to answer them for you. Thank you very much, Katie and Sonia. That's excellent work, actually. In fact, when you have um, sent the initial version to us, we were very excited. This is something coming to help our trainees, which is they are particularly struggling at this time to get basically their training modules si uh, signed off. Um, I think uh, that's excellent. Um, I'm, I'm encouraging people if they have um, there are questions, but they're all excited about it. Um, this is fantastic and superbly done. Um, I have uh, questions um, in terms of, I know you've been liaising with the Royal College. How much is the Royal College uh, we're keen to take that up as to be part of their, um, to be on the e-learning? Uh, particularly Sadiq was here this morning and he's going to be, the, he's the e-lead uh, for the Royal College. Yeah, so, so it's a really good question. Um, and as you can imagine, the faculty have been pretty overwhelmed over the past few months, trying their best to establish um, an online examination for the first time um, and come out with all the guidance. So, so training is very high up on the, the agenda and they are in, in the process of developing um, some uh, remote virtual online training under the guise of the faculty. So they have asked us formally if we're happy to be included in that. I think I think the the current thinking is that we will they, they will link to our site so that gives us control on the content but also um requires us to sort of make sure it's quality assured etc cetera, etc cetera, which is entirely appropriate i think um so so yeah so i think that the initial time frames are probably the new year before it's linked formally linked to the faculty but yeah we've, we've certainly got the support and i don't think we've had any 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 negative about it at all um and i've also i was I presented this at a faculty meeting yesterday um, and this will be news to Kate and Richard, but there's a, there's a whole heap of trainees around the UK that are really keen to get involved and help us, yes. um, you know, to, to, do, to develop more modules because, because they are, they are quite a lot of work. Um, yes. And, and certainly the content is, is, is very rich. There's huge amounts of learning on there. So Excellent. I think now is the time that we, we, you know, we would like to take this uh, further um, and, and, and get, and get get support from from clinicians in other areas of the UK, and I think Kate and I have mentioned this already. But I don't think we want we we don't want to limit this to 
anaesthetists training. I think yeah. I think this is a model that will potentially lend itself to to, to many other disciplines. Um, yeah, it is excellent. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, uh, it's going to be a good resource um, for our allied health professional that we're working along. I've got another question, Sonia. Um, uh, it's it's a it's uh, are the training modules in line with the different levels, such as intermediate or higher, etc. This would make a very useful for training to evaluate trainees progress in the high level uh yeah kate are you happy if i answer that yeah go for it yeah, yeah, yeah. so so the initial it's, it's a good question because um we we've we, we thought on similar lines so our initial on our initial ideas were to to get a huge cohort of intermediate trainees so intermediate trainees are those um the junior end of the registrar scale who have to do compulsory units of training just to get their anaesthetic um, consultant sort of uh, qualifications. Um, so they're the, they, were, they were the biggest numbers that we were certainly struggling to get through traditional pain training programs right at the beginning. So, so our talk, target audience was intermediate trainees. As we've developed these modules, we've realised the the learning is far richer than than is required just for intermediate trainees. Um, certainly, they're quite challenging. Um, they're not easy modules. Certainly, the MCQs. Uh, I wouldn't get 100% in them and we wrote them. <laughs> so they are they are quite challenging. Um, and I think Kate and Richard would probably agree. The, these these are modules that, that our higher trainees um, and advanced trainees would certainly get a lot out of. I think it's difficult to, to, to pigeonhole them for one particular type of, you know, a level of trainee. Having said that, that when we look at the core clinic, core, core clinical learning objectives and the, the learning outcomes, we've, we've mapped them to the intermediate level curriculum. But certainly the content, go, I think, goes way beyond that. Yeah. Can I, can I add to that, Sonia? Please do. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, would, I would say, though, that the experience we've been having from um, non-doctor professionals has been that um, because there's so much information and you can pick and choose which information you access, um, it does start pretty basic and... Um, people can skip past that information if it's really well known to them or access it if they wish and so we've had people a psychology trainee um, and a physiotherapy trainee with no medical background um, prior to joining the pain service who, who've accessed them and found them very accessible because of the fact that there's a lot of um, a lot of background in there too yeah definitely no excellent no that's fine um um, I think um, we pretty much on time with our um, with our talk. Um, Sonia, are you going to talk about the uh, Faculty of Pain Medicine update uh, now? Uh, I, I don't think um, at this stage I've got any more to add than than is already. Um I've already said really that the faculty yes. has a huge amount of work. There's, there's there's loads of information on the website, so I'd encourage anybody that's got any particular um, questions to, well, they can come, certainly come by me and I'm happy to put my email address um, on the chat if necessary. But the faculty website has really got lots of the current current um, guidelines and the and the stuff they've really, really worked hard to, 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 to disseminate over the, the COVID pandemic. Um, I know they've had their challenges. Certainly admin have been quite thin on the ground so so but they have been really helpful in in, in replying to emails etc so if, if anybody's got any questions um on behalf of the faculty i'm more than happy to put it to them on our, on your behalf uh, there's one um one just one question just came in from uh, dr tawheed um is how long it will take to complete a module in line with the intermediate level of um for example uh, i i'd say probably and you're looking at an hour, but you could easily spend two on each one. I mean, each each one represents a, a, a morning's worth of clinic, really. Excellent. Uh, can I ask a question? Like, uh, for chronic pain uh, in intermediate like, uh, module, intermediate level training, how many of these sessions we can sign off out of the 15 like, chronic pain sessions? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the, the short answer is we're trying to take our pragmatic approach. Okay. So, so for those trainees who are doing intermediate training, the traditional um, benchmark has been to uh, to achieve a minimum of twenty sessions in pain medicine. So that could get, could encompass persistent pain, inpatient pain, outpatient pain, however you want to call it these days. Um, so the faculty are um, supporting us to, to, to allow five of those modules to be what they call as complementary modules. 
of which um, that would include things like e-learning, case discussions about complex patients, MDT discussions, um, and, and, and the, the, the faculty have supported the use of these modules to, to sign off. It's difficult to put an exact number on anything. It's, it's about competency-based, and I'd, I'd advise any of the faculty tutors signing trainees off that they, they have a conversation, they, they, they try and um, establish how much a trainee is gained out of each module um we want we want to try we want to sign trainees off we want to we want to you know allow them to progress careers in as pragmatic a way as possible we also want to ensure that they get what we want to we want to we want them to get from from pain medicine because this might be the only chance in their careers they get to get to learn about pain so um that's, absolutely. yeah that's true and I, i'm happy to take any if there's any individual and um, uncertainties i'm happy to take you know um, individual calls or whatever is, is needed to, to support to support you in that. Yeah, we will leave the questions on in the chat box um, for people, uh, basically for for your later to answer. I think we got a coffee break now, and we'll be back um, uh, twelve ten past twelve for our last sessions of the of the meeting, uh, and it's going to be exciting. I'll give you a few more some times for you to uh, chill and have a coffee. See you, uh, see you shortly. Thank you very much for both of you. It's been a pleasure to see you both. Thank Cheers. You.
seconds and we can start I think uh, it's zoned yeah it's unmuted so. yeah right welcome back everyone uh, <clears throat> the next topic is on uh, pelvic pain which is a kind of a not easy to manage the first talk is on uh, the menopause and musculoskeletal pain by Ms. Uh, Rhiannon Griffiths. She is a specialist physiotherapist from uh, Anirun Bhavan University Health Board. Her clinical interests are in pelvic pain and the patient pathway management of pelvic organ prolapse and incontinence. She is currently completing her MSc and her dissertation topic is looking at a service redesign for patients patients presenting with urinary incontinence and prolapse. She hopes to give you some insight into the symptoms and management and how these patients may present in a MSK pain setting. Over to you, Rhiannon. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for having me today. Um, great pleasure to be here. Right, I'll just you. And can you all see the PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see that. We can see you, yeah. We can do that. Excellent. Right. Um, so, um, like the internet said, I'm a clinical specialist physio in pelvic health, and I'm based in Anaya in um, Bevan. And I've also got a part time role as a pelvic health coordinator as well for the trust. So basically just um, an overview of what menopause is to start off with. Um, so it's the permanent cessation of menstruation resulting in the loss of ovarian follicular activity. And it's a retrospective diagnosis. So it's 12 months of amorrhea is the only way to truly diagnose kind of like um, menopause. The average age of menopause in the UK is around 51. Early menopause is diagnosed as anyone who starts menopause before the age um, of 45 and then premature menopause is then anyone who starts menopause before the age of 40. So perimenopause happens between the ages of 45 to 42 and to start to get to get symptoms and irregular periods. Um, menopausal symptoms worsen then the last one to two years of the perimenopause and, um, and that's due mainly due to considerable drop in estrogen and progesterone levels. Um, Postmenopausal then is the period after the menopause, and sometimes these symptoms can last up to ten years um, after, after after menopause. So why is this important um, to us, and especially kind of like when we look at look at look at Wales? So we're looking at those age forty five to kind of like sixty four, and then in Wales that that's about twenty six percent of our female population. OK, and then, you know, when you then look in towards kind of like the older age group for those who have been through menopause, then you're then you're adding on an extra 11 percent. So there's about 30, 37 percent of our female population in Wales that have, are going through or have been through menopause. So the symptoms of menopause then. So they're wide ranging and officially there's kind of like 30, 34 of them. Um, from my role, from a pelvic health physio point of view, I tend to see um, more people who have stress incontinence, vaginal dryness, um, prolapse symptoms, dyspareunia, um, vaginismus as well. They tend to be the kind of like cohort of patients that come through to me in, in clinic with menopausal kind of like symptoms. But as you can see, there's lots of um, symptoms that people can present with. So from a survey, so why is this then kind of like important? So the British Menopause Survey, okay, surveyed. So actually 79% of women experience hot flushes, 70% experience night sweats. And then there's, a, you know, 36% then said that their symptoms impacted on their social life. 50% of women who have experienced menopause in the last 10 years have not consulted a healthcare professional about their symptoms, 
regardless of how bothersome they may have been. So there's a high proportion of women that are, who are not getting picked up with regards to the symptoms and actually having discussions regarding their kind of like menopause. So despite on average women reporting seven symptoms and 42% feeling that their menopause symptoms were worse or much worse than they expect, su suspected, many experience have been symptoms that they weren't expecting. Okay, so poor memory loss, joint pain, you know, and understanding kind of like problems as well. So when we go then and have a look at the research kind of like around menopause, when you're just doing kind of like a bit of a basic search kind of like in, in Medline, then, you know, you get about 70, 27,000 kind of like hits. If you add in pre and post, then that's 55,000. But then when you're talking about pregnancy, so it's another time like that women go through something that's quite um, predominant, then there's a lot more research regarding kind of like pregnancy. So then when you're looking at vasomotor symptoms, then there's about 800 kind of like research articles out there. Atrophy, so vaginal atrophy, about 300. Genital uterine syndrome of menopause. So this is about 261-ish. Two, and that's only because genital uterine syndrome of menopause. So your vaginal dry, dryness, your prolapse, your stress incontinence type um, symptoms. They've only been given their own classification since 2014. And then when you look at joint pain arthralgia, the research out there is much, much less. So you're looking at about 83 kind of like art articles that pop up and 60 of those have been done since 2003. So there's not a great deal around, around pain and menopause, but it is starting to pick up a little bit. So why, do, why are we talking kind of like about joint pain? Um, internationally, 50% of the population report joint pain during menopause, and it's the predominant symptom in 21% of the population. And menopausal women are two times more likely to have joint pain than their premenopausal counterparts. So why is this? Okay, so what's going on? What's happening with regards to lack of each estrogen or decreasing amount of estrogen that may contribute to kind of like some of some of these things so with a decrease in estrogen from a bony perspective you do get a decrease in bone density you get a decrease in ability to aid bone structure development which then is going to lead to increased osteoporosis and an increase in spontaneous fractures what we've also got to understand kind of like as well is that there are a population of people who are more at risk of having osteoporosis anyway. So those who um, have been on long term corticosteroids have got a BMI of less than 19 or if they've had absent periods for any period, uh, a prolonged period of time. So you could be looking at kind of like sports um, women, you know, ballet dancers, those who have got kind of eating disorders as well could potentially come into this um, population. And then obviously smokers as, as, as well. So that you increase then going your risk of osteoporosis and, and fractures then going through kind of like the menopause. From a muscular point of view, then you do estrogen, a decrease in estrogen results in a decrease in muscle mass, a decrease in strength and then change in muscle fibres. So what tends to happen is you get a change of um, a decrease in your type 2 muscle fibres, um, which leads to atrophy of the muscle and degeneration, and they converted more into type 1 um, fibres. And there's research out there that does say that there's an accelerated decline in women compared to men postmenopausally. Also as well, they've done some research, a lot more of it has been done kind of like in rodents, but there's 20% less force generated post kind of like oophorectomy. Um, I think that's queried down to kind of like the myosin numbers decrease and then you get those structural changes as well. So then you get a loss of fast twitch fibres and resulting then in a loss of balance and a loss of speed. So all these things can then contribute to an element of kind of like joint pain or an increased risk of falls and fractures then. From a tendon and a ligament point of view, they take longer to produce new collagen fibres. There's an increase in the breakdown of fibres and also there's an increased kind of like recovery period as well. So we know kind of like when you're looking at kind of like the pathology of things kind of like um, tendinopathies, that women are more predominant to get Achilles tendinopathies and plantar fasciitis and those kind of like um, syndromes 
postmenopausal or when they're going kind of like through the menopause. Also as well, there's just that increased stiffness in, in, in the tendon. Okay, so the stiffness of the tendon kind of like decreases then. So the tendon then doesn't have the ability to transmit and store energy as it would would like to. So then you're more likely to have failure load. So again, you're more likely to rupture kind of like certain um, um, tendons and, and ligaments. And this has been found more kind of like lots of more ACL kind of like laxity and, and Achilles as well, kind of like in the postmenopausal um, population. And estrogen then has a positive effect on healing. So without that increase in oh, good levels of estrogen, your healing time increases and then your, your cell proliferation as well kind of like comes into effect as well. It doesn't work kind of like as well. So there's a number of things. Then when you're putting all these things together and link towards kind of like pain and poor recovery and lack of stability. So from a joint perspective, then, when we're looking kind of like at our knees, our hips, um, estrogen receptors are found in all joint, joint tissues. So your cartilage, your ligaments and your synovium. Reduction in the resistance to articular cartilage compressibility. And then there's an increase in inflammation as well within the joint capsule. Um, and then on top of that, then you've also then got the effect of lack or decreasing estrogen on your muscles and your bone which you know we all know that kind of like good muscular support good ligamental support all contribute to good healthy joints um so when we're then looking at joint pain severe or very severe vasomotor symptoms tend to be a really big predictor of of this so if this is you thinking your hot flushes your night sweats, those are kind of like your vasomotor symptoms. Premature menopause as well, so those who go through menopause early are more likely to have kind of like joint pain. And then kind of like or more like and then postmenopausally again they're more likely to have some of these symptoms. Why do they think um the vasomotor kind of like symptoms kind of increase joint pain? Um Increase. They think maybe it's around to do with the increased sympathetic activity of the central nervous system, or is there increased sympathetic activation contributed to the initiation of hot flashes? So there's a narrow thermoneutral zone in symptomatic women, so they're just more prone to being able to feel things a lot more. Estrogen deficiency then plays a role in initiating or accelerating disease processes in a, in OA as well. And women showed a higher rate of knee joint cartilage loss in compared to men. So then when you're looking at menopause and then chronic pain, fibromyalgia, so what I've done here is taken those initial kind of like symptoms of menopause. And what's in red are those that you also get in patients presenting with fibromyalgia and chronic pain conditions. So we've got about kind of like a 50% kind of like crossover here between symptoms of menopause and symptoms of fibromyalgia. So is there actually some estrogen element that kind of comes in line kind of like with um with fibromyalgia and chronic kind of like pain descriptions so what this has come from a lit review that was done in 2009 so fairly recent um evidence really from that point of view so fibromyalgia can begin after menopause in some patients and a third of women with fibromyalgia tend to have early menopause Menopause are women with fibromyalgia experience the symptoms with greater intensity than non-menopausal women. And a direct decline, so those who go through surgical menopause, so have had a total hysterectomy or have had to have oophorectomies for, um, for any particular reason, or they've had shorter exposure time to ovarian hormones, so just early onset of, of menopause, or again, those who have had um, periods of absent menses kind of like in their past are related to worse pain in fibromyalgia hysterectomy then with or without etherectin can be related to higher pain worse um, fibromyalgia impact question is and worse physical functions as well so then this kind of just does make you think a little bit about okay is is estrogen an indicator of fibromyalgia or, you know, does it, does it correlate, correlate? How does that kind of like set in and work with the, with these kind of like pain, pain patients? So HRT then, so what do we know kind of like about HRT? We know that low levels of estrogens promote cartilage growth and prevent 
degeneration. Oestrogen is known to be anti-inflammatory. It's needed for pregnancy. And younger RA patients tend to get better during pregnancy. And HRT is known to reduce inflammatory markers. So whilst there's no been any specific research out there regarding HRT and pain and joint pain and symptomatic and, pe and people presenting with pain, it's not been it's not licensed for joint pain as such. But what we have known when they've looked at the big studies and they've looked at the symptoms is that women who are on HRT have less muscle mass loss, they have better strength. They have less arthroplasty, so there's a lot less kind of like hip replacement, knee replacements in those who've taken HRT. There's less OA changes as well on X-ray of your hands and knees. And also as well, there's a reduction in pain. And they notice then when they stop taking HRT that their symptoms, their pain kind of like um, symptoms kind of like come back. And what do we know, kind of like, I know there's lots about kind of like HRT and kind of like breast cancer and the risks. And this is why lots of women are very reluctant. And I find that kind of like when I'm talking to patients in clinic, there's a lot of reluctance around taking HRT because of kind of like the history and what was kind of like noted in, in the press. But what we do know, I'll just take this in a little bit more, is that actually oestrogen only HRT, actually there's less cases of breast cancer in, in that population. What you can see is actually those patients who are overweight, so a BMA greater than 30, are more likely to develop breast cancer than those who are taking HRT. Um, and I think it's worthwhile having that conversation with patients because I think the under, um, understanding and the, what patients know kind of like about HRT is very much driven by the press. Um, and once you've actually explained to patients and given them the information that's available, actually they kind of they do go away and think about it. And I don't I don't prescribe anything, but I do say that you can take the information and take it to your GP. And lots of them do come back and say, actually, yeah, I've thought about it, I've looked at it and it's a good good thing. I have a couple of chronic pain patients as well who when you discussed about them, their symptoms of their that they're getting the fatigue and the, the general low mood that actually have gone away and they've come back and I said, I started taking HRT and I feel so much better. My fatigue is gone. My pain is, my pain's still there. But it's not as bad as what it was. So is this something that we need to be considering um, with our pain patients? So there are non-HRT options. Okay, When it comes to diet, we know that calcium, vitamin D and protein are really important for bone, muscle and tendon. Okay, Strength training as well or exercise in general. You know, it's really kind of like important for those things to kind of like come into come into effect as well. And then your non-HRT, black cosh, red clover, even primrose oil, ginseng, soy, and St. John's wort. There is a small amount of evidence like regarding that. And I think what's really important to remember as well with our, especially our pain patients is that you've got fatigue, mood change, poor sleep, anxiety and stress that are symptoms of menopause. But then we also know that from a chronic pain patient point of view that these symptoms exacerbate pain. So sometimes you've got this kind of like cause and effect that they're fatigued and therefore they feel the pain even more. And it's sometimes it's got nothing to do with their pain. Sometimes it might, they might just need their hormonal balance kind of like looked at um, kind of like a little bit more and looked into a bit. So my question really for you. Um, I'm a physio, you know, I see these patients, um, but does menopausal status need to be taken into consideration when we're managing kind of like pain? Are we doing this already kind of like routinely? Would HRT be of benefit to kind of like our pain patients? And, you know, I think the big question is, does menopause or certain symptoms of menopause predispose patients to chronic pain or fibromyalgia or does chronic pain or fibromyalgia predispose women to greater menopausal symptoms? I think that's, you know, a big question that there isn't any research on at the moment. And I think it would be a developing field to look at, you know, probably in 10 years time, we might have a few more answers with regards to, regards to that question. So... And a pause. We are no, there's itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. Very much an old kind of like perception of kind of like what menopause is. 
but it is a lot more complex than that and it does kind of like affect the women women on a whole and it's just a really complex thing and i think we've really got to start thinking about this when we're looking at our chronic pain kind of like patients and our joint pain patients as well because what else is going on there that could be kind of like contributing to to these to these women thank you very much for listening Any questions? Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. Any questions from the floor, please? So, so nothing from the floor. So, my my question for you is like, do you feel there's a role for a MDT clinics for these kind of patients? Yeah, I think so. I think it's um, I think it's very important to have an MDT approach. Um, I'm very lucky in um, in an Iron Bevan that we do have a chronic pain MDT service, which we are um, um, which we are starting to um, start back again. We've had a bit of a delay at the moment because of um, because of COVID, and it's a really useful kind of session to session to have really because in there we've got uh, an anaesthetist. Um, pain consultant, we've got a gynecologist, there's a public health physio, a psychologist and a public pain and nurse as well. So they are very useful because we all come at things from a different perspective and we all pick up different kind of questions as well. And it's and you know there may be you know maybe a clinic where no one ends up coming to physio and there might be another clinic where everyone goes to to physio and then and there may be some sessions as well, where actually a patient needs a little bit of input from everybody. You know, whether that be kind of like, let's have a look from a mental, mental point of view, or actually do psychology. Yes, I think, you know, we need to be discussing that. How is that affecting you? How are you managing those kind of things? And then it comes to be from a physio point of view to look at more of some, you know, maybe some of the pain issues that they've got or the incontinence and the product issues that they may have. So it's definitely very useful. Uh, the voice is breaking, uh, Renan. The voice is breaking. Your voice is breaking. Can't hear you. I think we lost. Uh, I think uh, yeah, we lost the voice. Sorry. Okay. Let's. Uh, yeah, let's give like a, a few seconds and see if we can get her back. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there's a problem with the connection. I think we can't hear you. Yeah. Yes, you had, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Uh, we can try again. Can you hear us? Rianne, do you want to see if you can press the unmute button? She's not on mute. She's not on mute, but it looked like the internet has been a bit ratty on her side, I think. Perhaps it might be... <clears throat> it might be worth to move on to the next uh, questions and we can get her back. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. If you have any questions, can you please, uh, put them on the chat box with so she can answer later? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Let's move on to the next talk. The next talk is on updates on chronic pelvic pain and management of vulvodynia by Dr. Shamila Kot. Uh, Dr. Kot is a consultant in anesthesia and pain medicine at University Hospital of Wales. 
she has a very uh, vast experience in pain ma- medicine. She has worked in like a different roles. Um, she was a previously Royal College of Anesthesia Regional Advisor for Pain Medicine for Wales. She is a clinical research fellow for drugs and physiology for the Cardiff University Brain Imaging Center. Her specialist clinical interests are pain and fatigue in systemic inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and in other chronic persistent conditions like fibromyalgia. Her research interests involve clinical and physiological aspects of preclinical and clinical pain using advanced uh, advanced imaging methods. Dr. Kaur. Yeah, you can start now. I'm trying to um, share screen. Give me two seconds. Good afternoon, Sharmila. Nice to I, see you. And you. I don't know what's going on, but it won't let me share screen now. Apparently, I have to open privacy settings. Sorry, give me two seconds. That's okay. Right. We let. We want to let. Uh, the participants know that you'll get a link for the feedback later. Uh, would you mind filling the feedback? And once you fill the feedback, you'll get the uh, attendance certificate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, so this is something we will obviously share with our attendees and delegates that those who managed to, we had limited uh, ticket availability on events, right? And those who managed to register they receive um, an email following the end of today's meeting and they can fill up the feedback and they will get automatically a certificate generated to them. Uh, alternatively, those who hasn't managed and they come directly through the Zoom links, they will, we will send them, uh, there will be a feedback appear at the end of their meeting. And if they can't, they fill in then. Um, hopefully. Sharmila, are you um, succeeding? Sorry. That's okay. Do you want Ben? Do you want to email it to Ben and he can put it on for you? Uh, yeah, give me two seconds. I'm just trying to. Sorry. Sorry. I think Rhiannon is in the chat now on her mobile as well. Okay. So she can listen to us now. Yeah, let me see if I can make her. Yeah, if she, she can listen to us, then I can ask her some questions from the floor. Yeah. Rihanna, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi. Um, yeah. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, there's a question from the floor. How would yeah. you begin the menopause conversation in your pain clinics? That's the question from non Griffiths. Yeah. Um, I think it just depends on kind of like the symptoms that they're reporting, the age that they are. You know, I think it's difficult from my point of view because I'm, I'm always coming think from a continence, a um, pelvic pain dyspareunia kind of like aspect of things. So I think it's easier to, you know, to start that conversation. Oh, you know, is it because of kind of like vaginal dryness? You know, have you noticed or what are, are your other, you know, how are you, how have you been going through menopause? We, you know, we routinely ask about kind of like menopause and periods and things like that in, in our clinics anyway. So we, it's just a natural thing that we kind of like talk about anyway, you know, so they, if they say they're menopausal or they think 
or they think that they are, um, then I, then I always ask, how are you getting on with that? You know, how are you managing your symptoms? What symptoms are you having? You know, have you discussed that with anything, anyone? Is that something that you particularly want to kind of like discuss with, um, with your GP? Um, and, you know, if they do, you know, then I the patient.co.uk leaflet on kind of like HRT is, is very useful. So I tend to print that off and send that away with them um, so they can have that discussion with their GP then. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't think there's any more questions. Uh, I have a question, sir. Um, in terms of, um, Rhiannon, very good talk. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry there is a technical difficulty. So that something gets out of our control sometime. Uh, oh, yeah, good. I know. It's good to get you back on online. Um, in your experience, those who have widespread pain, fibromyalgia type of pain, and what we think it's due to um, estrogen, uh, basically um, lack of estrogen in their system, how much do you think they will improve following treatment? Um, is that a big difference they notice? Or is it something that has um, to be along with other treatment modalities like we use in pain management? I think it's hard to tell because ev everyone's very individual. Like I said, the studies, mm -hmm. the studies out there yeah, at the moment I don't, don't know whether it is from at, um, they don't really look at um, pain as a primary kind of um, outcome of kind of like the HRT studies they're all secondary information so it's mm -hmm. really hard to kind of like extrapolate some of that data to kind of go yes this population will definitely improve um, if they take um, HRT but I think when you're looking at joint pain um, then I think you've still got to look in line with kind of like the other evidence that's out there with regards to um, you know strengthening exercise your BMI keeping a healthy weight because um, all of those things I think are really important uh, really important to do as well kind of like throughout um throughout their management so it may be that with some patients you know looking at their estrogen might be enough for them um and then with others they may need to use kind of like toolkits alongside kind of like the chronic pain management and pelvic um, and pain management programs that are out there as well and i understand there is a bit of risk of um estrogen and cancer and there is a belief of that increasing risk of cancer how does that yeah. mean explained to the patients in in your experience i think it depends i think it's it can be quite difficult because there are some i think in some general practices there's still that ingrained belief you shouldn't be you know your own be allowed to be on HRT for five years or 10 years and then you've got to stop it um, whereas when you're looking at the more recent evidence that's out there is actually as long as you start um, HRT earlier you know so before the yeah. age of kind of like 55 then actually the risks the risks are there but it's patient but it comes down to patient choice so it may be it, it's what what they think they find that HRT is really, really beneficial to them, and for them, that outweighs the potential small risk that might be kind of like from a cancer cancer perspective. So it's laying out all the information, decision making process. Then really, this is the information that we know about. This is how you found it. So you you can make that informed decision um decision yourself um i mean we're you know we're lucky and i'm pretty sure in most kind of like health boards there are menopause specialist services out there and most most of them have like a advice email that patient um clinicians can contact to see actually i've got this patient are they okay to be kind of like on um estrogen um for a long time and there are certain I know that I think I saw in the chat there was um, something about kind of like um, breast cancer and tamoxifen. Um, the, from what I understand from my menopause nurse specialist is that actually sometimes those discussions can be had. It just depends on the level of the estrogen and how it is provided to the patient as to what they can tolerate and what they're allowed to because systemic 
and transdermal may have a different effect as opposed to kind of like oral if patients have the vaginal kind of like symptoms that actually are called vaginal estrogen they may be able to tolerate i don't know enough about um breast cancer and um and and estrogen but i know we've had that conversation with our pause and they're very much like send them to us and we can have that conversation we can go through those options for them so that menopause nurses are very very knowledgeable with regards to what is available and what patients can have i think that is excellent thank you very much uh, Sean, um, Rian, and i'll pass it on to sunil to lead the second session so yeah Shamla, is she, uh, dr court is she available oh yeah Ben, can we un? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Excellent. Um, and you can share my screen as well now? Yeah, we yeah, can yeah. See. It's, it's all on the screen now. Great. So you can start. Okay. Lovely. Hi, thank you for um, inviting me to speak at the WPS. Um, it has been a really great conference so far. Um, and my topic today is update on vulvodynia and chronic pelvic pain. Um, and I'm Sharmila Khot. I am an anesthetist in Cardiff and Vale. And for some of my time, I also do some research. Right, so the context of this talk really is that female urogenital chronic pain conditions are among the most under-researched, understudied, and underfunded conditions. Female participants tend not to be included even in preclinical research, interestingly, uh, and male rats tend to be used commonly in many pain models, particularly because of hormonal variability. Uh, we also see that about 79% of animal studies tend to be on male rats and about 8% on female rats. And this was cited in Greenspan's paper in pain in 2007. 75% of cancer studies underrepresent women. And we know that cells, when they are taken from male and female mice, respond differently to stress. And human cells display differing concentrations of many metabolites across sexes, suggesting that susceptibility to diseases, the diagnosis of diseases and treatment response would vary across sexes. Um, women tend to be underrepresented also in other clinical trials, including trials for statins for secondary prevention of coronary disease, which is quite interesting. Yet, we tend to use the same diagnostic criteria, the same sort of medications in a similar dose range and expect similar sort of response profiles from patients. And this is just the context around this talk, I think, you know, sort of why are we talking about female pain and female urogenital pain? And, and I'd like you to just park this somewhere in the back of your mind. So I'm going to first give a little bit of a brief background on vulvodynia. Vulvodynia is a vulva pain that tends not to be accounted for by other findings. Um, we know that it is a devastating condition, that we see small numbers of these patients through our clinical practice. Uh, the prevalence is about 9 to 18%, often accompanied by vaginismus. We often see patients who are severely affected in their quality of life and their emotional well-being. It is defined as a vulvar discomfort and is most often a burning pain, which occurs in the absence of any specific findings. And this is why patients tend to go through a number of specialties before they actually end up in a chronic pain clinic. Um, and the vestibular pain is pain that occurs in the vestibule, which is generally localized by point pressure mapping to the vestibule or in a very well perceived region in the area of the vestibule. Now, the diagnosis of vulvodynia was first established in, in the 1880s when it was called supersensitivity or hyperesthesia of the vulva. And it then disappeared from medical texts for about five decades until 1975 when it was described as vulva burning syndrome in the ISSVD World Congress. It is a diagnosis of exclusion. We know that it can present at almost any age, but it also presents in adolescent girls, and up to one in four women can suffer from vulvodynia. 
we find that it occurs in reproductive age and it prevents women from having children. Um, and, and indeed, I've had one such patient where we eventually managed to have a successful pregnancy, not we as in we. Uh, but in the end, we, we then had an issue where we thought, well, what is this going to do? Uh, what does this mean in terms of delivery? Is it going to affect the way she delivers? It, can she have a vaginal delivery? Um, and it was actually an interesting case that we followed through to the end. Um, she, we, we know that remission is rare. We, we know that when it occurs, it's between 17 to 25 percent. And, and I think as chronic pain clinicians, we need to do all we can to achieve that remission. It presents as a stinging, burning or irritating pain or discomfort in the vulva and is characterized by the presence of vulva allodynia, dysesthesias and hyperalgesias as well. We know that it can be either generalized or localized and can be provoked or unprovoked and tends to be about provoked in 80 percent of the women that present at the pain clinic. Causes can be broadly split into congenital and acquired, and it is thought to be due to proliferation of C fibers in the vulval mucosa or due to genetic polymorphisms that affect the inflammatory mediators. The acquired history generally includes history of sexual abuse, history of chronic antibiotic abuse, hypersensitivity to infection, to yeast infections or allergies to chemicals, particularly washing powders or other substances. Patients often have an abnormal inflammatory response, either to infection or to trauma, and there may be nerve or muscle injury or irritation along with hormonal changes, which Rhiannon has recently described to us. There are thought to be four or four described pathophysiological mechanisms. One is the sensory dysfunction of the pudendal nerve, uh, some, sometimes thought to be secondary to autonomic small fiber neuropathy, and I have to say this is my favorite explanation, increased sensitivity in peripheral body regions or altered neuroadaptation in patients with longer duration of pain or central sensitization, really. So this is, this is a little diagram showing the sort of dermatomal distribution of um, vulvovaginal pain or vulva pain or vulvodynia. And you can see it tends to be between the L1, S2, S3 kind of distribution. And there's a little bit of uh, detail on how to examine. And this is because there's a specific way in which you can elicit both allodynia and hyperalgesia or dysesthesia in these patients. And this is a very useful thing to do, I think, because it gives you a baseline QST, which you can re-examine after using different treatments in women to assess quantitatively their change in uh, pain. And like other chronic pain syndromes, this vulvodynia tends to be on a continuum where we start with some triggering factors, which may or may not lead to obvious vestibular tissue changes like inflammation, cytokine alteration, changes in blood flow, oxidative nerve damage, which then further lead to vestibular nerve fiber proliferation causing peripheral sensitization and pelvic muscle dysfunction in the pelvic floors. And this leads to central changes or central sensitization changes, which uh, gets our pain feedback loop going. Chronic vulva pain, we know that there are no visible findings except possibly erythema and pain can be localized to the vestibule and can be provoked or it can be generalized in multiple areas of the vulva and may be unprovoked but worsens with provocation. Provoked vestibulodynia can convert to a generalized vestibulodynia and may be primary or secondary. So primary provoked vestibulodynia is when patients have never really ever had not had pain on provocation. Uh, and secondary is when they've previously been able to insert tampons or have penetrative sex, but later on find that they develop provoked vestibulodynia due to other causes. In addition to all of this, patients often will have some pelvic floor muscle dysfunction or may or may not have coexisting pain disorders, for example, uh, diabetes, uh, fibromyalgia, may or may not have mood or sleep alteration, and often will present with some sexual impairment. There are these four questions that are thought to have quite a lot of sensitivity and specificity uh, for clinical diagnosis of vulvodynia. And the first of these is, do you experience genital pain? Have you had this pain or burning for more than three months? 
Have you had about 10 episodes or more of pain on tampon insertion, gynecological examination, or penetrative sex? And does pain on contact limit or prevent penetrative sex? I'm going to move on to something known as the Cardiff Valvotinia pathway. And it isn't really a Cardiff Valvotinia pathway, but I, I'm, I'm like, I like to call it that because we developed this as an MDT in Cardiff. Uh, around 2013, 2014, Caroline Scherf, who's the gynecologist that I worked with, decided that we needed to get together and discuss this group of patients because they were going round and round to all of the specialties. So it was about the right patient being seen by the right specialist the first time and prevent the revolving door phenomena and multi-specialty referrals at any given time. We therefore developed a plan by which the patient would follow an agreed plan and remain under the care of one or more specialists for the duration of treatment. We had a gynecologist, a dermatologist room, myself or one of my colleagues or the clinical nurse specialist attending this meeting, psychosexual counsellors and pelvic physiotherapist, generally it was Carol Broad at the beginning, who attended the meeting. Uh, the case discussions would last for about an hour. It was a usual MDT format lasting for about um, an hour, hour and a half during lunchtime on a Wednesday. And it was generally based on availability either every month or every other month. What really was helpful about this MDT was that we were able to address the more complex presentations and match up histories when we spoke to each other, especially if the patient had been seen in more than one clinic. And we developed an understanding and a respect for individual skills. But the other thing that we could also do was trial novel treatments in this clinic. So we were able to introduce new treatments and audit these treatments, but also get feedback from the MDT to help reduce some bias. Whereas if you have a new treatment and you treat somebody in your clinic, you tend to sort of think it works or you just have a one person kind of feedback. Uh, it improved our diagnostic skills. I have to say that hand on heart, it did make a big difference. And it was possible for us to escalate forwards to research if that is what we wanted to do. It also allowed us to have a sense of achievement when we had some small victories and felt less lonely through our losses. So this, this um, very busy, I, I, I asked, uh, I apologize for this, it's a very busy slide, but this was uh, one of the things that we developed uh, in parallel to having the Vulvodynia MDT uh, was topical gabapentin gel. And this is quite close to my heart because I was very intimately involved in the, in the development process. And as you can see from the slide, we, it, we went through a number of uh, research uh, areas and not only did we look at the quality of the of the topical gabapentin cream that we were developing, but we also did some very serious uh, investigations into A, does it go across the skin barrier? B, if it went across the skin barrier, do we, do we get sufficient concentrations across the barrier? And C, clinically, are we making a difference? So there were three different areas where we actually researched in order to bring this product into the clinical world while trying this on patients at the same time. The other thing that was happening was one of, the, one of our research uh, colleagues took some of the gabapentin gel as we were developing it away into the world of rodents and tried it on several different pain models. And one of the ones that they had developed, his group had developed, was a diabetic model of perineal pain. And we found that this is particularly effective in that model. Uh, he, this was published, and there was another paper that came look, trying this in a sciatic nerve ligation model in rats. And again, we had some success with this topical gabapentin gel. So it gave us the confidence, really, to push the product forwards and start using it more confidently in our patient group and follow it up with a retrospective review, uh, followed initially followed initially following a proof of concept study. Uh, so gabapentin gel product now in Cardiff and Wales is used in neuropathic pain conditions, which are topical and localized. And it tends to follow the neuropathic pain guidelines because it's locally developed and because we have confidence in the product. Uh, we have uh, published regularly, presented it at national and international conferences, and it has led to orders for the product and feedback of efficacy from other centers in the UK as well as Europe. 
this was then this was then this has taken about seven years or so of development and development of confidence in a product but of course there are issues there were no issues with ip with this product um i gabapentin is already there and somebody owns the ip and so we weren't able to get it forwards to a licensed product although we were able to trademark the product under the name gabagel then one of my registrars advanced pain trainees at kevel who's now a consultant uh took this forwards and did a two center survey evaluation of gabapentin gel the second center was nottingham where david nuns who is well known in the world of albudinia um decided to evaluate this along with us and and it was great because we had validation that this product works it doesn't matter it's not just cardiff centered it works everywhere uh we then published in several different journals including the pharmaceutical journals dermatology as well as our british pain society journal there were publications that came from across other countries and they used it for facial pain facial neuropathic pain especially facial neuropathic pain which may have been related to trigeminal neuralgia and we've had some success in our local pain clinic with this as well so it's just a little brief um slide really to talk about what i do with these patients because i seem to see a number of these patients in my clinic partly because i attend the mdt but partly because you develop an interest in in managing this pain especially if you succeed in doing it and and clearly you know it i follow the kiss principle keep it simple sharmila uh, including a biopsychosocial assessment which includes previous psychosexual history doesn't labor on it but definitely there's a there's a component where that history needs to be elicited uh there is used to look at superficial pain allodynia along with other neuropathic symptoms and signs and pain with penetrative sex if you do get your neuropathic signs and symptoms follow the neuropathic pain guidance which you would have developed for your locality and try your neuropathic medications and where initially I used to use start with amitriptyline and gabapentin I have to say I've transitioned now to trying duloxetine as first line treatment partly because it, it is high up in our neuropathic pain guidance but also because it seems to be quite effective we then add gabapentin gel topical uh, either 6% or 10% initially starting with the 6% using it three times a day application for a one month period with review at the end of a month as far as possible uh the the way it is prescribed because it's a special medication is that it tends to be prescribed from secondary care and secondary care only if required on examination we will then send patients for pelvic physiotherapy as well and in combination with pelvic physiotherapy and or psychosexual counseling and medical treatments we are often able to move a number of these patients further forwards than where where they were when we first saw them so So that was my little talk on valvodynia and I'm going to swiftly move across to chronic pelvic pain actually. Uh and this particular chronic pelvic pain that I'm going to focus on is mesh. Um some of you may may be involved in MDTs uh now for people who may be coming back to say we want this mesh removed but we all are aware of this huge issue that came up a couple of years ago when when vaginal meshes uh, were thought to cause people to develop chronic pelvic pain were eroding through and had more complications than than were expected and the the prolapse mesh implants were developed as simple flexible polypropylene plastic which acts as a scaffold to treat urinary stress and incontinence and the uterovaginal prolapses they take a very short time to implant it was either a day case or maybe one day overnight stay and it meant that it transformed the way people were were doing these surgeries and a complex surgery was replaced with a simple mesh implant people were developing acute pain or severe acute pain immediately post operatively uh, and it was really important to manage this to prevent chronic post surgical pain as with any post surgical chronic pain mesh erosion rates were thought to increase to about 42% at the end of 7 years and by and large nearly half the women with mesh erosion remained asymptomatic but as with all chronic post surgical pain conditions the relationship for expression of pain was complex in individual patients 
So these were some of the things that were published. You know, there was the BMJ published about the vaginal mesh implant manufacturers being aggressive about marketing the product, that the evidence base for the product was very flimsy, that they were introduced too quickly, uh, that it was a wallet driven research. And, 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 and of course, this meant that the advertising was that patients with mesh naturally felt really concerned about their about whether they would develop any of these issues in the future. So there were a number of patients that were coming back to ask about whether they needed their mesh removed. Uh, so pain after TVT, we know that some patients will present with worse pain after surgery. And indeed, I've had a few referrals over the years with patients who said that they woke up from the surgery, they have severe pain, and they were discharged, but the pain never really went away. Uh, it has been said that if the pain is associated with tenderness on gentle probing of the vaginal wall, it may be useful to add some topical amitriptyline or topical estrogen to maintain maturation. And it has also been mentioned that people, that women who develop chronic pelvic pain secondary to mesh tended to be more sexual avoidant and non, had complaints about non-sensuality and vaginismus. So this is what happened more recently is about two years ago, um, there were two centers were, were accredited by the BSUG, which is the British Society of Urogynecology uh, in Wales, in Cardiff and Swansea. Uh, and this was to develop an MDT really to make decisions about mesh removal. Do people, do all women require their mesh removed? Are there some who can live with the mesh? Or what particular investigations would be needed in order to make these decisions? And the decision, uh, and I was invited to be a part of this MDT, partly because I don't think they would have got an accreditation without a pain specialist being a part of the team. Um, so when I was invited to this, um, this MDT, uh, I attended the MDT not knowing you know, how this was going to develop over time. And I have to say that this has been a very swiftly developed MDT, which actually has matured really well. Uh, we have gynecologists, urologists, colorectal surgeons, physiotherapists, psychologists, pain specialists, as well as the incontinence team that attends this MDT. A number of patients get discussed at the MDT and not all of them are necessarily pain, but most of the times when they have got patients with pain relevant information, they will inform me and make sure that a pain person is represented on that MDT. It does, it is very much based the management plan on individual patient presentation and it, the patients taken by whichever team is most appropriate. Now identification and initiation after two years is of neuropathic agents sometimes is by the gynae consultant if it is bando neuropathic pain. We have seen patients presenting with pudendal neuralgia, obturator neuralgia, genitofemoral neuralgia as well, and diagnostic blocks will be tried. Pain clinic appointments are reserved for the more complex presentations for trial of further medications or in combination with pelvic physiotherapists. We have also discussed the possibility of use of electri electricity or electrical stimulation modalities, including spinal cord stimulators by neurosurgeons. And I have one patient that has been referred to this. Sacral stimulation for incontinence. And I know there's one patient in our MDT that is also has had a sacral cord stim uh, stimulator inserted for incontinence. And posterior tibial nerve stimulation is fairly commonplace and is either offered by the pain uh, team or by the urogynecology team directly. Very rarely we require one-to-one -one psychology via the PMP, but that can be organized if needed. So Kuna and Flo, in their nature reviews, just changing track a little bit from the MDT to pain physiology, um, describe beautifully our, our pathways, the spinal reticular pathway, the descending pathways, the spinal thalamic tracts, and all the areas of the brain that are important in are descending pain control, but also in pain facilitation. And we can see that the sensory motor areas, the, the supplementary motor cortex, ACC, PCC, prefrontal cortex, thalamus, PAG, all of these areas are really, really important and play a big role in, in how we perceive pain. Uh, but actually, 
our pain brain connection is much more like this. Um, and I was actually going to tidy up this diagram. Um, and then I thought to myself, but this is how patients present in the clinic, isn't it? This is how they, this is how messy it all is. And, and while we have the end organ at one end and the brain at the other end with the spinal cord in between, we have plenty of stuff going on, which either improves our resilience or increases susceptibility and leads to either pain control or pain amplification. And yes, brain mechanisms are really important, but there's also this other bit about life experiences, mood, placebo, temperature, fear, which, which has to be taken into consideration when we, when we see how we are going to move forwards with our patients. So I'm going to talk a little bit, if time permits, uh, on brain imaging research and pelvic pain. And surprisingly, there hasn't been that much brain imaging research published in this particular area of pelvic pain. But there has been this really nice study where they have looked at healthy volunteers who were given some pain stimulus for about 20 minutes for about eight days. And then their brain was imaged, functional imaging was performed on the first day, eighth day, 22nd day, and one year. And they showed that gray matter in the brain in the pain areas increased. And there was a substantial increase in these areas. And the reason I introduced this, this particular brain imaging research was the fact that actually dysmenorrhea presents like that, doesn't it? It is an intermittent episodic pain, uh, which quite possibly leads to these sort of gray matter changes in the brain and whether that itself would then in the future have some kind of impact on how women experience pain or how their sensitivity to pain changes is something that would be quite an interesting topic to look at. Chronic pelvic pain has also undergone some brain imaging studies in endometriosis patients, interestingly with and without, so pelvic pain with and without endometriosis. And the results of the study suggest that Basically, whether or not you had endometriosis, as long as you had pain, you would see a change in the gray matter volume in the brain regions. So we know now that brain changes with chronic pain. We know that gray matter alterations are seen, either an increase or a decrease, depending on the type of pain we experience, uh, type of nociceptive stimuli, stimuli that I experienced, if it's an experimental uh, pain stimulus. We know that the structure can be altered, the white matter connectivity can be altered, we know that resting state changes are seen in the connectivity of how different brain regions work together at the same time. We know that pain evoked functional connectivity changes, that there's change in the way cortical representation happens in phantom limb pain, for example, and that glial activity at the cellular level is also thought to be one of the reasons why chronic pain presents itself. And on the because a number of patients with chronic pelvic pain, vulvodynia, present with musculoskeletal or pelvic flow physiology, and the importance of pelvic flow physiotherapy cannot be underestimated. And we know that primary motor cortex and premotor cortex and supplementary motor area and the cerebellum play a big role in, in chronic pain. So it's not just the sensory areas and not just the pain matrix, as people call it, um, that's involved in, in maintaining and generating chronicity, but it's also the motor networks that are involved. And so uh, you know, I cannot minimize uh, the role of pelvic flow physiotherapy in managing cr chronic pelvic pain conditions. So uh, the last few slides are just very quickly, they're taken from the European Urogynecological um, Organization, and they are just looking at different axes and the classification of chronic pelvic pain. And what we really see is the axis seven, isn't it, where people come with all of these symptoms. And as a result of all of these symptoms, we then work backwards almost into trying to classify or diagnose where that pain is. And one of the recommendations of this, um, the society, was involving a gynecologist to provide other therapeutic options, such as hormonal therapy, which is really important, or surgery if that's required, but also to provide a multidisciplinary approach for which there's a strong recommendation and for the involvement of psychological support for psychological aspects of chronic pelvic pain. Interestingly, 
for behavioral strategies for patients to reduce sexual dysfunction there didn't seem to be the recommendation strength rating was quite weak and i suspect that's because of the uh, the publication bias there so this is what happened in may now is that there are new regulations that have come through as a result of not just this scandal but others around hip and breast implants as well where the existing framework is undergoing fundamental revision to make it safer for women to undergo such kind of surgery in the future so these are some of my references that i have used in order to create this talk i'm very happy to share these references with people and i'm going to leave you with this thought that this is why i think we play such a big role in in working with people with pain is that while pain is an inevitable consequence of living suffering is definitely optional and this is where i think i'd like to like to be able to do one of these days is is sleep on a bed of nails and make it possible thank you um thank you for an excellent presentation there are a lot of questions on the gaba gel many okay. people are asking how you can source gaba gel okay and before uh, you yeah before you start uh yeah. what kind of side effects you need to warn the patient okay so what we tell the patients before we offer them the gaba gel is one is that it's a specials so it's not licensed and we let them know that it's an unlicensed special we also tell them that we have developed expertise in managing and using gabagel by just using it in people basically and we have some animal studies which assess to its safety so we i always follow with follow in with this before we prescribe it because patients have to agree to have it before you can prescribe it um the third is there are there are two main side effects one if patients have sensitive skin and have reacted to previous um skin skin um, preparations um then you would suggest i would suggest not to use it because they may react to the lipoderm base that is being used so they won't react to the gabapentin itself but to the base and that might be and you'll get clues because they'll say they get rash when they use any any kind of ointments and and so i wouldn't recommend that then and they can get rash when they use that which can be easily cured by stopping it and giving them some sort of um either anti antihistamine or steroid based cream that should clear it up um and the second is we have had one person tell us that they felt sedated with this cream it's a 6% gel it works topically we don't get uh we don't see blood levels that would lead us to believe that it is a systemic effect um so i ha- i haven't been able to explain that one but we had one person in the entire time that that actually said that they felt too sleepy but apart from that we've not had any side effects that that have been obviously coming from this gel and how can we source this like if somebody wants to prescribe this like because not so, all places yeah so we the other thing we do is we tell people that we can only have confidence in the gel that we have tested um yeah. one of the issues we've had is there are other there are private so we, this is developed in the saint mary's pharmaceutical unit which is cardiff based which is an nhs unit yeah. there are other private pharmaceutical units which are you know there's no ip so anyone can make this really and can sell it at whatever price they want because it is a unlicensed special uh, but we we have a pricing structure it can be ordered from the saint mary pharmaceutical unit they have sent it abroad as well so it's not just us that have access to it the pricing structure is different we get it cheaper because we are in cardiff uh, people who order it outside of wales would probably have to pay a little bit more Uh, but otherwise it's not difficult to get and i can send you the details for saint mary's pharmaceutical unit if anybody wants to directly email me for it perfect okay and there's one more question um with use of gaba gel can you leave out the systemic neuropathic agents in swansea it has been removed from formulary due to poor evidence ignoring the lack of side effects generally and our own experience in those we managed to give it to um Have you done some audit? 
in Swansea? Are there any specific patients that you've tried it on? It would be very interesting to know because this is why we did a two-center study, right? Because we thought that we were biased, that we were giving it to our patients and we were overstating the effect, uh, which is why we sent it to Nottingham to David Nunns, who, is, uh, who, is, who used to be the president of the National Velvetinia Association in Britain. Um, and and he, he reports exactly the same results that we had, that at least 50% or more patients that are given this medication for vulvodynia definitely had a response to it that was about 30%, at least 30% or more change in their pain. So I, I wouldn't stop people's oral medication if you have found that a combination is making a difference. Um, having said that, I mean, I've previously had great success with only duloxetine without needing to use gabapentin gel. So whatever it is that works for that particular patient would be the right medication for them. In, in my view, as long as some, some treatment is given for this condition after it's recognized and picked up as vulvodynia. So, you know, getting, getting the right patient and getting the right treatment, I would say. Okay. Are there alpha 2D receptors peripherally where gabapentin works? Are there other countries which have used topical before? That's one well, of the I think there are countries using topical. In fact, in fact, when I went to India recently, I picked up two products. One has gabapentin, ketoprofen, and methyl salicylate ointment. Yeah. And one has methyl salicylate, linseed oil, capsaicin, and menthol. So, yeah. Other countries are making their own products as well, um, I suspect. They're probably doing it in Spain and elsewhere. Um, there was another question. There was something about gabapentin not being useful. What was the other question? Sorry, Sunil, I've lost track. I mean, uh, are there alpha 2D receptors peripherally where gabapentin? That's a, really, that's a really good question, actually, because that was one of our next steps that we had applied for EMI, which is the Efficacy Mechanisms Effectiveness grant uh, ages ago but because a there's not much interest in developing topical agents or or researching them or or the population is thought to be really small that we could target they're not uh, homogenous uh, we we weren't successful at all in in attracting any grants for this type of study and i think partly one some of the reason might be around ip the fact that it's not a new molecule, it's not a new drug, you know, there's no money in it for anybody. Uh, so, and I think that might be one of the big reasons. So I don't think there are alpha-2 delta calcium-gated voltage channels. I think it's more likely to be TRPV1, but I have nothing to base this on. So, uh, yeah. The last question. Um, would screening patients for central sensitization disorders, genotype, phenotype, reduce the risk of post mesh tape pain syndromes? Uh, ooh. Pass. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I don't know if there's any... Do they mean in terms of susceptibility to developing chronic post-surgical pain. I think that's what we probably also thinking is whether yeah. it is, there's some sort of screening. Possibly. I mean, possibly, I think, you know, because we know that there is sensitivity to, to pain, which varies based on genotype and phenotype. So yes, I would say quite possibly if it is a question about whether or not patients are likely to develop chronic post-surgical pain, but also other screening, not just that, you know, you would want to look at, how their psychological profile is. So not just genotypy, maybe psychotypy. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for the excellent talk. And that's, I think, that we have time for. Um, I think, yeah, I think we're just coming to, to closing this meeting. And I, uh, and I would like to basically uh, thank all our speakers for their excellent talks and our delegates for managing to attend these meetings. Without them, this meeting couldn't happen. And I would like especially to thank Ben. He's um, our specialist um, trainee here in the hospital. He's been a great, um, basically, help for us to organize. And special thanks to, Tha uh, to Niraj and then obviously uh, for being part of the organizing committee and Rahul as well. Um, I would like to remind all, all delegates that there is um, those, as I said, who's managed to register on the Eventbrite, they will get um, a feedback form and they will get um, a certificate 
after they filled in. Those who hasn't managed and they would like to get a certificate and they directly joined us via Zoom, this is the survey link and it's you can either use the barcode there to <laughs> basically um, access it. Um, following um, this meeting, we're closing. There will be those who are Welsh Pain Society members, we will be running um, basically annual general meeting uh, at half past one. Uh, there should be an email being sent out to everyone. Thank you again for joining us and we will hope to see you again in future for future meetings. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks.